Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Today we have got episode 24, and this is going to be our little, like the first crossover episode, first NBA and NFL episode we're going to be doing because we posted our first NFL short last week. And y'all went crazy. Still going right now. I think it's almost at 22,000 views on the Instagram right now. So, look, y'all talk. We listen. We coming at you with our first little half NFL episode. Very shortly, we're going to be doing a full NFL episode. So, I know mm-hmm. people hit the both of us up asking if we're going to do any type of NFL coverage, any type of NFL episodes. Because people are ready for football season. So, right now, we got... The first half of the episode is off the glass. That second half, we coming off the gridiron. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so, look, if you if you do or just interested in the NFL stuff, we're going to have the timestamps in the description, so you can probably sit fast forward over to the mm-hmm. halfway part of the episode. If you're going to watch both of them, you go through the whole thing, you're a real one. We appreciate you, as always. But on today's episode, we're going to still be continuing with our top 10 position rankings in the NBA Um, So we're about halfway through now. So today we're going to be doing the top 10 small forwards. And on the back half of the episode, we are going to be diving into the AFC North division in the NFL, giving some predictions um, for how the division is going to play out. And then our predictions in terms of the final regular season standings and wrap the episode up up with some over unders on some NFL futures bets for both player props and final team records. So a lot to get into today. So going to get the housekeeping out of the way as always if you're on uh, youtube be sure to like comment and subscribe to the channel if you're on either of the audio platforms be sure to drop a five star uh, rating um, and leave a review pre-download the show it helps us out a ton before we get into all of this how are we doing today dame i am excited man i cannot wait for football season bro like i just oh, i can't wait i'm so i'm so excited like this is one of the best times of the year you know, that's fantasy football time, real football time. It's, just, it's amazing, bro. I can't wait. I'm so excited, bro. Yeah, that first episode of Hard Knocks got me. Oh, it got, yeah. It got me juiced. Watching, watching Robert Sala do that, uh, what was it, like the Crows and the Eagles? Mm-hmm. The Crows just pecks at him. The Eagle just flies high enough to where I was trying to figure out where he was going with it. Yeah, that. I wasn't right, following it back together. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, back together. When he put it together at the end, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm ready to run through a wall. I'm right. ready. Yeah. I'm ready bro, to go. when you a head coach, how do you come up with that stuff? Like, is there like a book that you read? Because it's like, bro, every head coach got something like crazy story, metaphor, analogy, like. And like and it's a long story. I swear, like they go to some coaching class and they have like books with all that stuff in there. I used to wonder that, and even when I was in, like we were doing it in college, like our head coach, shout out Coach Urban, <laughs> um, would always come through with crazy analogies, stories, and I'm like, sometimes you're like, I don't know where this is going, and then when he ties it back at the end, it's like that was perfect. Like I made right. it made so much sense. So I don't know. It must there might be like some secret head coach group chat everybody <laughs> gotta <stories>. be <laughs> um, but yeah that i'm excited for hard, hard knocks the preseason has been great already the first couple games that we've had some people have been showing out so excited to, to really get to touch on the nfl because i know this was a basketball podcast originally but we're both too big in the football to not to not cover <laughs> it a little bit so we'll get to that we're gonna go right ahead and hop here into the small forward list and before we get into this today, I'm just going to throw the name of pools out there or the name of the players in the pool out at y'all. So when y'all hear the final rankings, I'm like, how did this guy not make the list? There's a lot of good players that we have listed in the small four pool. So in no particular order, we have got Kevin Durant, LeBron, Jason Tatum, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, DeMar DeRozan, Jimmy Butler, Mikel Bridges, Brandon Ingram, Chris Middleton, Andrew Wiggins, OG Ananobi. And then, like, I don't think these guys are going to be on either of our lists, but, like, Kuzma, Franz, Wagner, J-Dub, Jeremy Grant. Like, there are a lot of big names that we have in this pool of players. So just keep that in mind now as we're about Mm -hmm. to enlist this top five. And, again, as always, this is not fully based on their past season or their entirety of their career. Like, we're also projecting a little bit into next season with, you know, team fit, how that team is projected to play, what their role is going to be. Some of these guys are on new teams or the teams around them look completely different. So all of those are going, um, 
you know, into our, our consideration when we're putting together these lists. So got all of that out of the way. Starting off at number 10, who do you have as your top 10 small forward going into next year? So my top 10 small forward going into next season is Chris Middleton. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, um, Chris Middleton is interesting because he's coming off a year of like riddled with injuries. So like even when he was back, he wasn't fully himself. Like I think he played well in the playoffs, but other than that, like he was just, you know, recovering from that. I think it was a knee injury that he had. So mm. Chris Middleton is a guy that I still put him up here out of respect for the fact that he's a he can be a number two on a championship winning team. And a lot of the guys that didn't make my list, I, I can't really see them as being number twos on a championship team. Like like I said, I would love to be able to slide a couple of these guys that didn't make it up here, but just out of respect, just out of like what he did and the fact that I still believe he can have another solid year alongside Giannis in that Bucks offense. He has a huge role in that offense. I just think he, he'll have another solid year, another year removed from that injury. I think he'll be pretty good. So he was definitely my number 10 um, small forward. Yeah, I again, like I said, when I first was thinking through this list, I'm thinking of like number 10 being a guy like, you know, maybe OG or Wiggins. And then when we really right. listed out all these players, like some of these guys are probably not going to play the three a ton this season. But like if even for a guy like Kevin Durant, who probably is going to spend most of the season at the four and they'll probably start somebody like Josh Okoge at the three. In our heads, Kevin Durant's still small for, small forward. Yeah. Like he, I can't list him as a power forward. I just right. can't do that. I'm sorry. Paul Paul George and Kawhi both can't play the three at the same time, but they're both small forwards. Mm -hmm. Really, positions don't matter anyway. We're trying to fit people into boxes right now for purpose of ranking. So, if anything, it makes it more interesting as we get towards the top of this list and have to really start to split hairs with some of the top guys here. Um, but like you said, um, for number 10, I also have Chris Middleton. Um, again, wanted to see, I really like OG's game. I really like Wiggins, but it's just like, I can't put either of them in Chris Middleton's category. Um, like I said, know, technically though, even though Wiggins technically was a number two on the championship winning team, now that I think about it, he, he was, was it, it, there is a, I think all three of them have cases to be made. Um, I'm just projecting that, like you said, I think Wiggins to me, I, I think I mentioned this before, like. Not that, like, he needs to prove anything to anyone, but, like, he has to have a bounce-back season. Like, obviously, the injury really bogged him down last year, um, even when he was able to get back. I think his regular season counting stats, he finished, like, 15 a night. So, if he can get back up to, you know, close to 21 points a game, um, really kind of take back that second option from Drew Holiday because – if it progresses the way that it was towards last year, like Drew Holiday was the second option. And, and again, a lot of that was just due to his injury and how he was able to come back from that. But at the end of the day, like you can't, it's hard to think of somebody that would fit better next to Giannis, like somebody who can create his own shot, somebody that's great at spacing the floor, um, great perimeter shooter, catch and shoot guy. Like those are all things that you need next to someone as dominant on the interior uh, as Giannis. So I'm hopeful for a bounce back season for him. Um, and since we're talking about Chris Middleton now, I don't want to spend too, too much time on it. Cause to me, I think this was a little outlandish, but Evan Turner was on his podcast and he did say that he thinks that uh, Chris Middleton and Jimmy Butler, that's like a true debate as to like which one you would, you would rather have. Between um, Chris Middleton and Jimmy Butler. Yeah. So what? I don't know if you I, have any any thoughts there. I didn't think that was a true debate, but <laughs> I've never heard that. I've never heard that quote, and I've never heard that comparison before in my life. When did them two get on the same level at all? Like, I'm no. <laughs> let's just let's just stop. I'm not doing that. And that's not happening. Chris Middleton is not on the same level as Jimmy Butler. Like it, to me, it, it feels very simple, right? Like. If you swap them, you put Jimmy Butler and the number two on mm -hmm. a team with a legitimate, like, at, right now today is a top five, maybe four player at his position ever. Like, it's not that many power forwards that have ever played the game better than Giannis. Versus you put Chris Middleton on that Heat team. What is the, first of all that Heat team doesn't come out the plan. That Heat that, team it, it, might not make the, 
the playoffs. They're not. They're not going to make the playoffs, and they're definitely not beating the Bucks team. If you put Jimmy Butler on that Bucks team, the one that torched the Buck, like right. come on, bro, like that just doesn't make sense. I, that's dumb. All right. right, Jimmy. Jimmy almost gave that Bucks team forty a night in the first round. Why? Why are we doing this? Like, I'm not hearing that, bro. I don't I'm know. Not, I, that's the dumb. Even stats aside, it's just like Chris Milton is a like when he was healthy was a very good defender, like above average defender. Jimmy Butler is on another tier when it comes to that. With when it at least come time for the playoffs, the shot making elevates, the aggression elevates. Like he's able to get downhill, get to the free throw line. Like that scoring jumps into another realm, which at absolute worst has got to be on par with what Chris Middleton is providing to me at times is better. I just don't see how that even like, where does that even come from? I feel like some of these players just be pulling stuff out of nowhere. It's just dumb, bro. It's just dumb. Just dumb. Plain okay, simple. cool. Glad we on the same page with that. Um, who's your, who's you got at, at number nine on your list? Um, number nine, I actually have Brandon Ingram. Brandon Ingram is number nine on my list. Now, Brandon Ingram was tough. Um, I was trying to find a way to put him a little bit higher, but the couple mm-hmm. guys that I have higher, I just like what they give me just a little bit more than Brandon Ingram, even though I've seen a lot of I've seen a lot of great things from Brandon Ingram, especially later in the season down the stretch, with not only just his scoring, which is his ability to run the offense, his ability to play make a little bit better. Um, obviously with Zion L, he basically had to step up and be the one over there. So moving forward, he's gonna be the number two if Zion is healthy. And honestly, we talked about it plenty of times. That is a very scary team. Brandon Ingram mm-hmm. being your number two and Zion when he's healthy plays like a top 10 player in the NBA. So I'm excited to see what they do moving forward. Like I said, Brandon Ingram showed me great. I mean, he's always shown flashes. Like he's always been really, really good. But I feel like last season, later down the stretch, he really, really showed that he can kind of take control a little bit of that offense, yeah. play, make, run the offense a little bit along with his scoring when he needs to. So I like what I've seen a lot from Brandon Ingram. So he's, he's number nine for me moving forward. Yeah, for those of y'all listening or watching – I am a big Brandon Ingram fan. So I also tried and thought of ways to maybe argue him a little bit higher up this list, but I also have him at number nine. Um, I just, I can't really find a way to get him any higher than that. And that's, again, it's not even a knock on him. Like we said, when we started this segment, there are a lot of heavy hitters in this category right now that we have to rank. And so it's hard to really get him up any higher, but Like you said, what, and I think I mentioned this before, what really impressed me the most, really these last two seasons with Zion's injury and how the Pelicans roster is constructed has been his playmaking and his ability to not just be one of the best tough shot makers and shot creators in the NBA right now, but he's also giving you like six assists a night and very often being that initiator or facilitator for that Pelicans team. Because again, it's really either him or CJ, and neither one of them are naturally fit to do that position. You know, like CJ having played so long with Dame, B.I. typically always being the score option, like both of them having to kind of expand their game in that way. And to me, I think B.I. has taken the biggest leap in that category. In addition to he's giving you 25 a night and just the way that he plays, it's so smooth. Like I said, one of the toughest shot makers, like, at times, he feels like one of those throwback guys who can just give you a bucket in so many different ways. Um, and it's like sometimes so many of his shots are like, that was good defense, but that was better offense. You know what I mean? Like he just yeah. he makes those tough fall away jumpers. Um, the KD comparisons are always going to be there because of the slender, tall body frame. But um, some of it is really warranted in his play um, and how he kind of works out of that mid range area. So, um yeah, I, I think having Zion come in next year, hopefully healthy, that's always going to be the hope. Like, again, I don't know what that points per game is going to be. I don't know what that playmaking load is going to be next year because when Zion was healthy, they were really trying and pushing this point Zion, you know, and it looked good <laughs> when he was healthy. So um, he may be able to kind of take a back seat in that role and kind of, you know, really kind of become the number two option and really be able to just be the score, um, you know, kind of Robin in that sense to Zion being the guy there in New Orleans. So 
for that reason, that's why I have him at nine. But like I said, in terms of just like player bias, like B.I. is one of my favorite guys to watch in the NBA. So I wish I could put him up higher, but I just can't with the guys that I have in front of him. And so um, I kind of have a feeling I know who your eight is. I feel like, honestly, now that I'm looking at it, like our 10 through six is probably going to be identical. So who do you have at, at number eight? You actually might be surprised with my number eight because I just switched it, actually. And I've been okay. flipping back and forth between these two. My number eight for now, because I must, might switch it again, is DeMar DeRozan. Mm, um, okay. Yeah. And so you know who I have at seven because I, like, literally – it's between those two guys. I yeah. can't, like – I'm like, bro, who would I rather have? And I just feel like the guy at number seven, his defense, is what kind of put it over the top for me. That's really what it, it ain't just the defense either. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. So like, but all right. So let me just go ahead and say my number eight, like I like I said, is DeMar DeRozan. Um, I'll just talk up DeMar DeRozan before I compare him with my number seven. Basically, at this point in his career, you know what DeMar DeRozan is. Um, he is a scorer, he's not gonna shoot a lot of threes, he's a mid-range scorer, he's a mid-range assassin, matter of fact. Um, yeah, he's a really bro, he's a really good player. Just the, the I think it was not this past year, obviously, but the year before, wasn't he like in MVP conversation? Mm-hmm. Like when he was he legitimately in Chicago, yeah. Yeah, he was legitimately in those talks. So like DeMar DeRozan is a fantastic player. One of the one of the best, like just pure isolation scores in the NBA. Can score from pretty much every, anywhere besides the three. I mean, even occasionally he can step out and hit it every now and then, but that's not really his game. Can get to the mm-hmm. basket, can get to the mid-range, get to his spots, get to the free throw line. So DeMar DeRozan obviously is a great player. Um, but at this, like I said, at this point, you already kind of know what he is. He's a, he's going to average somewhere between 24 to 26 or seven points per game. Like that's pretty much what he is at this point. And the reason why I put him a little bit lower than my guy at number seven is just because, like I said, that guy at number seven, I feel like can do the the same exact thing. Maybe not as as far as mid range scoring. I don't feel like not many people in the NBA can score from the mid range as well as DeMar DeRozan. But just scoring from multiple different sp- spots on the floor, he can do that, in my opinion, just as well. He's a better three-point shooter. And defensive-wise, he's elite. <laughs> so, yeah, that's that's why I have DeMar at number eight compared to who I think you have at number eight. Yeah, and I'm, I look, you might have just sold me. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, look, we're, we're both talking about DeMar and Mikel Bridges. Right. And like you said, right, look, even just comparing their stats side by side. So let me make let me pull both of their stats up from last season, because when you look at Mikel's last season as a whole, he's putting up 24 and three. But if you just look after the trade to Brooklyn, uh, yeah, he's putting up 26. What is this? Four and a half rebounds and three assists. Um and had mul- I think he had multiple 40 point games like it was like a w- couple of days after the trade he had a 45 point game no he was hooping, and he's bro. scoring in every type of way catch and shoot off the dribble mid range getting to the bucket getting to the free throw line like that was something I that was like after that might have been our first or second episode um where we talked about I'm actually that, that was when I put out my first videos. This is like right at the trade deadline where I was talking about Mikel. And there was a period of time last year where Devin Booker was hurt. And obviously they didn't have Kevin Durant at the time. And so Mikel Bridges kind of had to step up and be their leading scorer and had multiple big scoring games, putting up 25, 30 points a night. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was like, okay, I didn't know Mikel could do this like consistently. Like you see that kind of growth in his game. So I said like right when the trade happened, like I would not be surprised if he comes to Brooklyn where it's low expectations. He's going to like the offense is going to run through him. He's the best player on the team now. Like, like let's just, how high can his ceiling be? And like 27 and just like, that's your first time really ever being in that role. Like now you're going to have a full off season. It's pretty much the same team. The expectations are exactly the same. I don't think they're really linked to any big name star. So, like right now, again, it's still Brooklyn Bridges, right? Like Mikel mm-hmm. Bridges is the guy there. Um, and so, honestly, I, I think I'm gonna also put Demar Derozan at eight and Mikel Bridges at seven for the same reasons. Like, 
It's just I don't want to say everything. It's not even that DeMar is necessarily on like a downward trajectory. It's just like Mikel is on just such a steep upward trajectory that when you look at, like you said, already was a defensive player of the year candidate, going to be a perennial all defensive guy and is now also can give me 27 a night. What can he do, bro? he, He can score. He can score just as good as DeMar DeRozan. From anywhere on the floor. And like you said, I didn't know he had all of that in his game. Like, the way he was scoring, I didn't know he had that much back. To he he would do it in flash. And like I said, those games without Devin Booker, I was like, okay. Like, you, you're you starting to feel yourself. And he was on uh, Paul George's podcast talking about that. Like, you know, it's weird going from that role where it's like you're just a catch-and-shoot guy. Like, you're playing with D-Book. You're playing with CP. It's like, I don't have the ball like that. And mm-hmm. it's like when D-Book got hurt, it was like, no, Mikel, like, this play is for you. We're like, nah, you have the ball. You have to create something. So he's like, when that, like, switch kind of came on, like, when it came on, it was like, oh, I know what that feels like now. So it's like when he got right. to Brooklyn, it's like, <laughs> he's already in that zone. He knows how yeah. to tap into that. Uh, so, yeah, that that's, I think, the way that you broke it down makes the most sense. Like, we know what DeMar is, and, look, you're going to get 25, 26 a night out of him. We have been very vocal about the Bulls and where that team is going. We think it's in probably the worst place you could be in, like a fringe playoff team with no real hopes of contending, but y'all are never going to be bad enough to really reset. Mm-hmm. So all of that you know, in mind with the fact that Mikel is now really going to be the number one option from the start of the season on a team that has, like, there's, not, there's no pressure, bro. Just go out None. and hoop. Just go hoop. And on top, this is also something I was going to think about saying for Mikel Bridges when we talked about him. This Nets team I is better defensively than the Suns, right? Mm-hmm. Like, he was the best defender on the Suns team. Between him and Nick Claxton, they're st- at, like, at worst, like, they're both two very elite guys who both can be consistent year in, year out, all defensive guys, and you have Dorian Finney-Smith, and you have Cam Johnson. So it's like this team is, I would say, significantly better on the defensive side of the ball, at least from just a pure talent perspective. Um, I can't forget Ben Simmons, too. So it's like, bro, that like, true. right, like this Damn, team is very on. deep from a deep, just purely individual defensive talent perspective. So – as good of as the defender that he is, that is going to be amplified because that team defense is going to be better. People are rotating smarter. The IQ is higher. People are mm-hmm. helping the helper that's helping the helper. Like everything right. is just on lock on top of the fact that he's about to come on the other side of the ball and give you 27. Man. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you got it right uh, putting them in that way. So I just switched the order on my sheet as well. So we both have DeMar at eight and Mikel Bridges at seven. Um, so first four so far, completely the same. Mm -hmm. Who do you have at number six? All right. Before we get to six, I just want to say, bro, he had 17, average 17 points a game and jumped up 10 points when he went to Brooklyn. That is wow. Wild, wild. (laughs) That is crazy. I don't know that how many players in the league could make that jump that quickly like I, I, you give any nba player who's like third option second option like you give them the shots eventually like they'll get comfortable with it but it was like i said bro he literally got traded and like two games later put it 45 i know a player that can make the drop off that quickly um <laughs> Joel and b from yeah. regular the season to playoffs i know someone who can make a 10 point <laughs> drop off that quickly but not a jump. I don't know about that. <laughs> That's a wild stray. Wild <laughs> stray. I just thought of it, bro. I just because like I remember seeing the graphic of like, bro, well, he averaged like 33 in the regular in the postseason. It was like 24 in the postseason. I'm like, God damn, bro. Him and Julius Randle. They oh, yeah. That's another no one. show. But yeah. All right. Let me uh let me be nice. I don't need to those strays at six fans. <laughs> um okay but my number six actually is paul george um basically we're getting <laughs> to this point where after paul george these are number ones in their team yeah That's, it's plain and simple like mm-hmm. paul george is a great player honestly when i really think about it we could have slid him on the shooting guard list possibly um but i mean it is what it is like like you said before like nba's position list at this point so it doesn't even really right. matter but 
Yeah, I mean, I don't even really feel like I have to go in d- deep into Paul George. Like, I feel like you know what he is at this point. He's a great scorer. Honestly, the best handles we've ever seen from someone that tall, like, as far as just those people who love, like, bag talk, all that, mm-hmm. Paul George is that guy. Like, watching Paul George is very, very fun. I'm not going to lie. And I'm being unbiased right now because, you know, I don't. I hate the Clippers. I hate the Clippers with a passion. But if I'm being completely unbiased, Paul George is a great player. He's a great scorer. His defense, I don't think it's at that, like, top-tier elite-level defense that it used to be. Yeah. Um, And, I, I mean, that's to be expected. He's a little bit older. He's, a, he's yeah. had some injuries. Like, that's just to be expected. And, like, he's taking on more of that offensive load, especially because Kawhi is out a lot of the time. So, there's a lot of nights where he's just the one over there. So, but, yeah, like, at this point, you kind of just know what he is. This is no slight to Paul George. It's just, like I said before, these next guys that we're going to get into are all number ones on their team. And Paul George, is, he's the number two. Yep. Um, I also have Paul George at six. So the, the first five players you've gone through, we have the exact same list. Um, I Who is he? He was interviewing, um, oh, my gosh, who was on his podcast that also went through a crazy injury? Cool. Clay? Yes. Um, and he was talking about his – his team USA injury. And I, I remember watching that game live when it happened. And I don't know why I even did this. But like I went back and watched the clip again. And it's like, as soon as it happens, I like flip my phone back over. Cause it's like, I can't, it's, bro, it just it's is like, bad. that is a freak injury. And it's in a team USA scrimmage, like not even like a Olympic game, a world cup game, not even like a friendly, like, no, it's like, we just split the team in half and we're like hoping to get running. Mm-hmm. And his leg snapped in half, like so. That was gross. gross. That is crazy. Thing. But I feel like that almost does not get talked about enough. Like that happened to him, and he's come back from that and is still capable of giving you twenty four, twenty five easily. He had his best season at, right, a couple at, years after right. that. After that happened, a few seasons later, was an MVP finalist in OKC and put up 28 a night with yeah. eight rebounds, four assists, 2.2 steals. Like you said, like handle-wise for someone his size, like, I think he's listed at 6'8", 6'9", like he has one of the smoothest games that we've ever seen from someone at that size, like on par with somebody like – Tracy McGrady of like being that tall, also that capable at creating their own shot like a guard, like really mm. like with their handles. Um, yeah, I like you said, the people in front of him are all not even that they're just number one options, they're all number one options on very good contending teams, right? Um, so that's really why I can't put him any higher than this, but like. Paul George deserves his flowers solely for that injury and what he's been able to do since then. Because that, bro, it's like watching it again is really like, bro, like that looks career ending. Paul like, George is like this generation's like Tracy McGrady almost. Like, you know how you ever hear like people in that generation talk, how they talk about Tracy McGrady? Like, bro, like he's just, let's take away accolades. Let's take mm-hmm. away he won this, did that, did that. Like, if we were just talking, like, just strictly playing basketball, like, Tracy McGrady was up there. I feel like that's how people are going to look at Paul George. Like, people mm. are going to look at Paul George. Like, like that watch Paul George, it was like, bro, he was, like, bro, he was nice. Like, if you're making, a like, a creative player, you're going to make Paul George. Paul George you're going to make yeah. a 6'8 guy that can handle, like, a point guard, that can pass a little bit, that's going to play great defense, that can shoot and score from anywhere. Right. That's Paul and, George. Right. And drive past whoever's guarding him and punch at the bread dunk. Athletic. That dunk in the Pacers Heat series is so iconic in my head. Like, mm-hmm. literally looked like a blur. Like, one hezzy and, like, took off to the rim and exploded. Like, Indiana Paul George is so different from OKC Paul George. And it's so different from, from the Clippers Paul George. And it's like Bro, all it's three forms are still able to play at a high level again because of how versatile his skill set is. Um, so yeah. Indiana Paul George was my guy. That's why I hated LeBron back then. So Indiana Paul George was one of my favorite players in the league. That Indiana team was nice, bro. It was, yeah. Nice. I used was to he was going toe-to-toe with, bro. Paul George as a number one option was going toe-to-toe with Miami LeBron James. 
took it, bro. He was giving the Heatles fits. He was going toe to toe with Miami Braun. Like, yeah, I don't know. Like, listen, him, I need and, my, him and Roy Hibbert five. versus the world. Yeah, bro. Like, people definitely don't give Paul George uh, enough respect. I do feel like uh, part of it is though. Just the fact that when he went to the Clippers, obviously, just like me, a lot of Lakers fans don't like the Clippers. And the fact that what happened in the bubble with the whole playoff P, I ain't see playoff P yet. And then he (laughs) come out there and decided the backboard. But even then, even after that, though, he did redeem himself because when he had that playoff run, when he went to the Western Conference Finals, when Kawhi was out. So I feel like he redeemed himself a little bit after that. So, yeah, Paul George definitely deserves his flowers. I'm looking at this roster from that series, man. Paul George, you had David West, Lance Stevenson, mm, George, George Hill, Hill, Roy, Roy Hibbert, Hibbert mm. Louis Scola is up here, CJ Watson. That was my favorite Butler. team. That was my fav- favorite team to use in 2K. Favorite team to use in 2K. Bro, the years before this, like it had to have been, what, like 2K12 or 2K13 before mm-hmm. Danny Granger fell off. Bro, the two of them was nasty. Buckets, straight buckets, bro. Nasty, bro. Um, yeah, we just like deep dove on Paul George, but that should tell <laughs> you as much of like, like you. I think you summed it up right, like with the, like how people will view his career. Like you take the accolades out, like when you just look at Paul George's career as a whole, like he's got the individual awards, like eight time All Star, All Rookie Team, had Most Improved Player, six time All NBA, four time All Defensive Player. I'm pretty sure he's been a DPOY finalist multiple times, or at least that year in OKC. He was also the MVP finalist that year. Will he will he win a ring? Will he not win a ring? Win a ring? I don't know. Like that may never happen. It's trending like a no based on this Clipper situation right now. But when you I think Pierre from Through the Wire said this recently, and like it makes a lot of sense. Like if we're talking about comparing guys who are outside of like the top 10 all time players, like how many rings they got, like that kind of gets a little bit irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Talk about them as players because people's situations are different. He, he, he always brings up like people discredit Carmelo because like the team success wasn't there, but it's like, if you're so big on team success, like James Jones got a couple of rings, Robert Horry got more rings than Michael Jordan. (laughs) Bro, if you're not in the top 10 conversation, rings or does not to me, like I don't care. Why am I comparing rings of to see if this guy is the 38th best player or the 39th? Right. Like, I don't care. Who cares? The only way I would view it is like if you if you like really led your team to a championship and like were the number one guy, you giving them like you're on a crazy playoff run, you get like you're carrying your team to a championship. I can use that to help boost you, but I'm not about to be like, this guy has no rings, can't do it. Like, I'm not about to tear them down that way because, like I said, it's not a, it's not a one-on-one thing. Like, rings are not a individual accolade as much as I feel like people make them out to be. There are players who may not win a ring, and that a lot of that has to do with their performances. But there are also some of them who like unlucky. It just like it's not it's very difficult to win a championship like Charles Barkley. We just was talking about this randomly in the group chat the other day. It's like, bro, Barkley is the same height as Jordan. According, they're both six, mm-hmm. six. This man was giving you 15 rebounds a night in the 80s in an era that's dominated like from through the 80s and 90s. Eras is dominated with Ewing, Elijah, Wan, like humongous seven foot dudes on the court at all times. And he's leading the league in rebounds. He doesn't have yeah. no rings to show for it, though. Yeah, but then people are going to discredit you. But you didn't win a ring. It's like, right. bro, who? Shut up. Who he can- made it. He made it to the finals. I was like, he just ran into freaking black Jesus. Right. He couldn't <laughs> he do ran nothing against Michael that. Jordan. He couldn't do nothing against that, bro. Like, yeah. if it's not the goat convo, if it's not top five, top ten. I'll maybe even give you top fifteen conversations because it gets a little nitpicky then. Anything outside of that, bro, I don't. Like, who cares, bro? If Paul George wins his ring, what does that make him? The top 
40th player ever. Like, I don't right. care. Who cares at that point? The only time, like it, like you said, the only time that that's really a valid conversation or argument is like how we was talking about the James Harden and, and D. Wade combo. It's like, right. James Harden, I mean, uh, Dwayne Wade led his team to a championship and, like, had one of the greatest finals run, period. Then it's like, all right, the ring kind of matters because James Harden, he's been the reason sometimes that like, he doesn't have a ring. Right. So in those conversations, it matters, but other than that, who cares? Who yeah. cares, bro? That's just so stupid, bro. Yeah. Um, let, let's move on to the top five here. Um, so who do you have at, at number five on your list? Uh, number five, I have Jimmy Butler. Now, Jimmy, everybody knows playoff Jimmy. Everybody knows how Jimmy Butler gets in the play all the time, man. But just these guys I have ahead of him are just the best of the best. Like, I right. just... I, I just we're at the point of the list where, bro, these guys are we're talking like best players in the league. We're not talking about like top five position. Like when we doing the point guard list, it was Steph obviously and Luca, one of the best players in the league, like top right. five conversation. But like after that, it's kind of top fifteen ish or whatever. Like just right. solid players. We're getting into like these are the best players in the entire NBA. Every right guy above Jimmy, like. If healthy is easily, I think, a top 10 player in the NBA right now. And it's no conversation, no debate about it. Right. So, Jimmy, just the fact that he's just flat out not a better basketball player than these guys. And just the fact that in the regular season, he does kind of, like, take his foot off the gas a little bit. He doesn't he's really do coaster, the same. He's a coaster, yeah. Yeah. And I'm not saying you have to go crazy in the regular season and then just to prove that you're, like, you can do this all the time. Like, obviously, like. He does this on purpose at this point. Like he saved himself for the playoffs, which is smart because he goes on long playoff run. Right. But I'm just saying, if I just look at which would I rather have Jimmy Butler or any of these guys ahead of him? Ten times just, out of ten, I'm picking every single person in front of him. I just yeah. wouldn't. I just wouldn't. I'm so I can't. And it's like right. people who try to compare, like not to get way ahead of ourselves, but like cause I've seen a lot of people compare like Jimmy Butler and Tatum. It's like, bro. Uh, to me, Tatum is a is a way better basketball player than Jimmy Butler. I'm sorry, it's just he just is. So like that comparison to me, I get it. Like they go at it in the playoffs, but it's like Tatum's beat him too. Jimmy's beat him a couple times. Like they've gone at it back and forth. All right. But if I'm just looking at a who is a better basketball player, give me Jason Tatum. And especially because his list is projections. Oh yeah, definitely give me Tatum. That's not even close. Right. Like, like we said the. This is the most, and I think it will be the most stacked position that we've ranked or position that we're going to rank because I don't think power forward or center is going to be mm. nearly as deep in terms of talent as this one is. So everything from here, like even going back to like guys like Paul George or DeMar, it's like those are very good players. Like putting the people in front of them says nothing about them. It just has more to say about the people in front of them being, like we said, everybody in front of, Paul jo- or not Paul George, uh, Jimmy Butler, who also is at number five on my list. Like, when healthy, top 10 in the league. Forget position. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and some of these guys, don't, don't, three of them are, I'm pretty sure, 75th anniversary players. Right? Yeah. Like, it's yeah. like we are looking at some of the best players to ever have played in the NBA. So it's not a knock on Jimmy um, that – He's not any higher. And I think he's a guy who is a clear playoff riser, but, like, he gets it. Just so much of it is, like, heart and energy and effort. And just, like, he just has that – literally has that dog in him. Like, like how he was going at Grant Hill in Boston – or not Grant Hill, Grant Williams in Boston. Mm -hmm. Um, Like – that is that's like Jimmy Butler. If you had to pick a moment to really like show somebody to get, let them understand who he is, like that is the one. Like, dude got in his face and he's like, I right, bet I'm gonna give you eight straight points and take the lead, right? Like, that's who Jimmy Butler is. Like, says so no slight, it just is people in front of him are different. So, who you have at number four? We have the exact same list already right now, 10 through five. So, who do you have at number four? Okay. This potentially could be where there's some shakeup, but so I'm a, I'm actually lumping my four and five. Be, I mean, my four and three because I got to explain why I have this guy four and this guy three. Mm-hmm. So my number four is Kevin Durant. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I'm gonna just say right now, my number three is Kawhi Leonard. 
Okay. Now, when healthy, and I don't even like saying when healthy because I hate when people say when healthy about Kawhi Leonard because he's never healthy. It's like at some point there is no when healthy. But Bro. I will say when Kawhi Leonard is playing basketball, he is the best player on this list. In my opinion, I think he's the best player on this list. When he's healthy, 100% and playing basketball, he's the best player on this list, in my opinion. But, like he's like I said, he's never healthy. And the only reason why I would put him ahead of a guy like KD is because KD is deal, deals with injuries as well. It's like, mm. Tatum, you don't, you're not worried about injuries. Braun, obviously, he had some injuries here before, but I would 100% trust Braun as far as health way before I trust KD or Kawhi. But a fact. Kawhi, like Katie has missed plenty of games himself. Kawhi has missed plenty of games, and Kawhi just feels like it comes at the absolute worst times. Yeah. But I have four K I have KD four just because I feel like I think if I had to pick one, I'd rather have Kawhi, but it is tough, man, because both these guys really, really, really struggle with injuries. And KD is also was four just because the last couple of times we've seen Kevin Durant, we've talked about it before. That series against Boston got absolutely boxed. Had a terrible series. Then his last series, um, he just was very, very inefficient. Had to take a lot of shots to get to those high scoring numbers that he had, but it was bad. Like he had like a two for twelve game from three. He had a game mm-hmm. where he didn't make any threes. He didn't and, yeah, didn't, I don't think he shot any threes in the the game they got eliminated. Yeah, in. yeah. And for and for time out for the people that was trying to go at me talking about Katie trying to defend your boyfriend Kevin Durant. The fact that saying, oh, no, he actually had a good series. He was getting doubled in triple teams. Bro, no, shut up. If you watch the games, Kevin Durant did not play good, and that's okay. I'm not saying he sucks. Right. I'm not saying he's not a top five, top ten player in the league. He just didn't have a good series. And if we're going off uh, – and also for the people that are saying it was recency bias, this is not just this year. Like I said, it was the series before that as well. It's like if we're getting on two past playoff series of you not playing well, Okay, this is starting to become a trend. I'm not saying it is a trend. I'm not saying he's going to fall off the face of the earth, but it's starting be- to become more common. And for a guy that's going into, I think he's like 34 years old, on a team where you have a rising, ascending Devin Booker, it's like it is not uncommon for him to take a slight step back. I'm not saying he's going to drop off the face of the earth, but the slight step back is not uncommon. So uh, that's the only <laughs> reason why I have him behind Kawhi Leonard. Bro, so the people that were upset with that video about is Devin Booker, it, like neither of us even really said it. It was just like I never it's said a, that. A question to be asked. Never, like I never, who is I the never even one said option? it. Right? Like, that's the is, funny part. I've never even like I. I'd get it if I was like Devin Booker clears K- KD. I said it's a question. Right. So that's, that's it. That's all. I, know. I just put it out there. That's it. Right. And all of a sudden it's like blasters. Oh my gosh, you're. How are you all over day book? Are you missing this KD? But it's like, like you said, A, th- first of all, I'll take a whole step back. The biggest thing that I've learned since we've been doing this podcast is you cannot appreciate, like, give nobody any type of flowers without it being glazing. And nice. you can't criticize anything without being a hater. It's no, it's no in between, bro. None you at can't, all. You can't like anything. You can't dislike anything. Like there's, no, you're never ever gonna make people happy, bro. And it's like it's so funny to me because some of us is just like, bro, y'all can't even like just have a conversation. Y'all can't just like think. It just is like it's gotta be. It's gotta be hate. It's and the people that hate. come at you about hating be starting to hate themselves. Like, bro, that I was going at it with one guy, mind you. Listen, if anybody wants to comment on any short, any TikTok, I don't run the Instagram, so y'all, sweet, you getting spared if you comment on the Instagram. Is Billy nicer than me? I will go at you. I don't care. <laughs> I'll go at it. So if you want to comment on the TikTok or the shorts, go ahead, be my guest, because I will go back and forth with you. But I remember a guy commented. He was talking like on about the is Devin Booker the number one over there. He was like, how can Devin Booker be the number one? He didn't even answer the questions at the end of the game in the press conference. And that's not a real leader. I said, whoa, what are we talking about? <laughs> what? Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, now you're calling me a hater. You're the one that sounds like you don't really like Devin Booker. But right. now the real hater in you is coming out. So it's like. Hold on, hold on, hold on. In Bradley Beal's introductory press conference, what did he say when he got to Phoenix? He said, he looking around, he said, man, look nice here. This book nation. That's what he said. 
What are we talking about here? What are we what are we arguing for? What are we arguing for? Like, who, I get it. who in the playoff series against the now defending champions went 20 for 25? Bro, like it's I'm not saying that in a vacuum I'm taking Devin Booker over Kevin Durant. I'm just saying right now. There is a conversation to be made because D book is really that good. We're not saying anything about Kevin Durant other than he had a bad series against Boston when he was in Brooklyn because he got double teamed a lot. The playmaking wasn't up to par against that defense to really make them pay for the double teams. They got swept. They were close in a lot of those games. Don't matter. You still got swept. And then against uh, Denver, very inefficient which is unlike Kevin Durant, like you said, to get to those 30-point games that he put up, he took like 28 shots. <laughs> you know what's crazy? You know what's crazy? I remember a comment this dude said. <laughs> he was like, I was talking about what, what Devin Booker did. I'm like, bro, this is like, he had like a generational like playoff series. Like, it, like you don't see that. No one scores 40 shooting 80% from the field. It just doesn't happen. Right. He was like, do you really think Devin Booker is like that? This is his first time ever doing that. You really think he's really like that? I'm like, he just, he just did went it. To the, he yeah. went to the finals. What are we talking about? He just went about? to the finals, and then he just did it. As, the number, as the number one option, they went to the finals. And he, he was scored, two wins away. He scored 70 points in the game before. He's went to the finals. He's been one of the best scorers in the league. He just had his playoff run. Apparently, he's like that, bro. Like, I don't know what you want me to say. Like, we're just going off of the <laughs> games. Even if you're, bro, it's crazy because it's like, if you watch the games, you'll see that he's like that. If you look at the, even if you didn't watch, you just look at the box score, you'd be board. like, "Oh my god!" Like he putting up, my he's clearly like that. Lines. He's clearly like that. Whether and I think a lot of it is like certain, like people dislike certain people or people love certain people to the point where it blinds them. Like you just can't right. see, like in certain people's minds, you cannot see a, a world where a KD is on this team and he's not the number one option. And I, like, I understand where you're coming from sometimes, but it's like, bro, you have to be a little bit more open minded, bro. You just can't have this, like, super, super, like, bias for certain players, bro. Just open your mind a little bit and relax. Like, like we said, we didn't even say he was better. Like, we was just asking a question. Right. And the people so that crazy. are, like, trying to say D-Book is only scoring as many points because KD is taking all the attention. Do you think NBA teams are just like, dang, bro, this dude had 30-plus last game. Oh, well, let's, let's go out with the same defensive scheme. Let's just. We're just not going to let KD get his all. Bro, D-Book is the – bro, I just said he went 20 for 25. There's a point in that game where he was probably like 10 for 12. You don't think Mike Malone is over there like, I don't know, we got to send another. Like, Bro, bro. I, I, there was a, there's a clip where Book is dribbling down the court, and the, the double team is coming. Like he's running at Book, and he just like pulls up from three in their face and catches it. Number that, like – you think like like people really just think that like all right they were just doubling KD and Book was going one on one all game all series, no like no they were trying to stop him too they weren't just they don't want Devin Booker to go out all there right. and score forty shooting eighty percent that's they why don't you want that they don't two, let that happen that's why you put two elite scores on the court at the same time because it's like you it makes it very difficult to double either of them because it's like if you do. You're making it so hard on your defense. It's like, oh my gosh, we're about to let KD get single coverage. We're about to let <laughs> Evan Booker get single coverage. Like, that's this is how it works, bro. I don't. If y'all were thinking about starting a podcast, bro, say what y'all want to say because you're never gonna please anybody. That's why, I did, bro. I don't care anymore. I'm really just. That's going why I don't be going. Whatever. That's why I don't, I don't respond to none of the Instagram comments. I just look at them and I laugh. I'm like, bro, what are you talking about, bro? I like responding just because I like see. I like seeing the the stupid logic like i just want you to explain yourself and a lot of the time like i genuinely don't think i've lost an argument yet and i'm not all and i'm not saying i'm we're right all the time i'm not saying that either i'm just like bro dudes don't be making sense <laughs> like it makes sense bro i've had comments i've i've talked to people where it's like oh i see where you're coming from oh yeah maybe right. you might be right because that's because that guy was like no like i think blah 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 and he like genuinely just says his reasoning not like hostile not Combative, not argument. I'm like, okay, I see where you're coming from. But 99% of the time, the people that's like really get really, really mad are always wrong. It's and it's so funny. That's why I love going back and forth. It's so funny. Yeah. But it's like a one of the short, but that's your it's like a 30, 30 reply thread. <laughs> and me and this guy just go back and forth. It's hilarious. 
it's funny the ones that really begin people like in their feelings, like the bull bull ones shocked me. I was like, when did <laughs> when did bull bull get all these? And, and like it's crazy because the context of it, like the short makes it look like I'm really going at bull bull's head, but really. If y'all go back to that episode, I was getting that animated about it only because people are talking like Bull Bull is coming to save the Suns. And I'm like, bro, what are we talking about here? Bro, the Bull Bull one is the funniest one in the world because I definitely did not expect the comments to be like that. And I'm like, bro, where are the Bull Bull stands coming from? Like, what? But I had a guy say, you're just trying to get clout. Off a of bull bull. I'm like, off of who? Right. Like, I, bro, if we wanted to get clout off of hating a player, Every... I'd just be like, Steph stinks. LeBron right. is what? Like, bro, I don't need. Don't what did you see that dude said LeBron not a top 100 player? Right. Like, all bro, he I... do is dri- dribble out to the half court line, <laughs> switch till he get a guard on him, and, and drive to the put his shoulder. Like, that's clickbait. That's right. clout chasing. You just bull, say craziness. Bull. Bull Bull, so I'm talking about Bull Bull because I want to get clicks. <laughs> bro, the what? logic is, bro, that is so funny, bro. So I like. I'm gonna I'm a, I'm a so clarify funny. it now. I have, I've always, I'm never gonna not root for an NBA player. I've, if everybody could average 20 and be great, I would love for that. It's not the way the game works. I have no wishes for Bull Bull to be bad. I was only saying that because, in the context that y'all were making it seem like. Oh my gosh, the Suns picked up Bull Bull, locked them in to win the NBA championship. <laughs> Bull Bull is on the roster. It's not moving the needle like that, bro. bro that's just... Who's protecting the rim? It's DeAndre Ayton and Bull Bull. That rim mm. looks sweet. It is it, that one, it just is kind of funny, bro. Cause like I'm not gonna lie, watching TikTok back, I was like, damn, he's really blacking on Bull Bull. <laughs> Yeah, it was not really directed at <laughs> Bull Bull as much as it was like people on Twitter and like Suns fans making it seem like they done hit the lottery. My like thing was when Bull they compare Bull Bull to Wimby, I'm, I'm like, that's what the part mean? I was like, bro, what are we talking yeah. about? Yeah, and then the Bull Bull Big Four with KD, <laughs> yeah, and Bill, like he's not gonna start. I don't. It's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't <laughs> understand it. Um, look, shout out Bull Bull. I hope it like everything clicks at some point. I just, it's not moving the needle, bro. Um, let's wrap up this top 10 small forward list. Um, you oh, had, you God. had KD at four and Kawhi at three. I mm-hmm. have it inverted. So I have Kawhi at four, KD at three only because to me, like who's more injury prone, especially when it comes to playoff time right now is Kawhi. Um, and it's like, <clears throat> I can't, it's not even, I don't even want to really make it a knock on him, but it's like aren't on the floor it's hard to like really get an accurate gauge if everything was healthy like like you said I think Kawhi has a real argument to be number one on this list that run with the Raptors is gonna go down as one of the most iconic playoff runs of all time that was one of the last times we've seen Kawhi fully healthy for a playoff I think he's gotten injured every year except for that bubble year whoa, 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 whoa. but I'm gonna say that bubble year You're right he was, uh, there. he was there he was there he was healthy <laughs> up 3-1 um but yeah every year after that he's gotten hurt and then missed that the 21 season with the the ACL tear off of that jazz series um so first of all uh Zaza Pachulia <laughs> ruined this man's career. Facts. Um that is crazy. You're a bum. Um <laughs> <laughs> but but no like for real it's really just injury at that point. Like it's hard to want to put Kawhi better because or higher because the low management and then like even with the low management he gets into the playoffs and it's like something like it just breaks down so frequently. Yeah. Um, so that's why I have it that way. But like health not being a factor, like Kawhi definitely has a case to be number one on this list. Uh, so since we did four and three, um, I'm interested how you have two and one because it's Tatum or LeBron in some order. So who do you have at, at number two? No, I, I got Bron two. I got Tatum one. I got I Bron think... two, Tatum one two. <laughs> yeah, I just uh Ron's old man. <laughs> he's just old man. That's just all I can say. Look, he's, you know, though he's still 
a top player, but I don't know. 29 like, a night at age 38 is insane. Still. Yeah, yeah bro. Like, I just, like, I've. Even seen... the fact that it's like debatable, like, right, like one game right now today, like the fact that you really would still be like, yeah, I would want LeBron at about to be age 39 is insane, bro. That's mm-hmm. crazy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think me and you are both very, very high on Tatum, and like rightfully so. Like Tatum is he's one of the best players in the league. And I just think that like we said, this list is projection. LeBron is getting older. Um, the injuries are starting to pile up a little bit more. Like, I don't think he's like injury prone now, but obviously the last two seasons has dealt with a little bit of injuries, and I think yeah. Tatum, besides the the freak accident as far as like him rolling an ankle in that game seven like he's not he doesn't deal with injury problems well he had the um, shoulder the year before that in the, the warriors series. oh yeah that is true i did he, he played he did. through it yeah um <clears throat> but no nah, i just think i don't know man like like i said this list is projection i just think tatum they're prime to make i mean they've been in the, uh, making deep playoff runs for the past i don't know how many years but since they came in the league yeah like so i guess you can't say they've been primed to make a deep playoff run or like a real finals run but i genuinely feel like this is one of the best chances they have to win the finals that they had since they've been in the finals i guess since mm-hmm. 22 season and I, I genuinely i think they could do it like seriously i genuinely think if i had to pick today right now a team to go to the finals out of the East, it would be the Celtics. And I think Jason Tatum would have like a top tier all time type playoff run. I genuinely do. Um, yeah, and then Bron, like I think he listen, I, obviously I'm a Lakers fan. Like I think the Lakers are legit contenders this year as well. Um, I think Bron will have a good year, but I do think he'll take he'll be able to relax a little bit more this season. Like he won't have to go out there and average 30. I think he still can if he wanted to, but Having this new team or, or the team we've had last year, basically just a little bit upgraded a little bit, having that from the beginning of the season all the way into the whole season, LeBron is not going to have to play all those minutes. He's not going to have to average 30. Mm-hmm. So I do think come playoff time, like that will benefit him like greatly. Like he could be primed to have a really good playoff run. But as far as just his raw numbers, I think you could see him taking a little bit of a step back for sure. So that's just the reason why I have Bron in two and Tatum in one. Well, yeah, I think a Tatum put up thirty, almost thirty-one points a night, right? Or what he averaged last year? Um, it definitely was over thirty. Yeah, thirty point one. So really, thirty points a night, nine rebounds, almost five assists, um, and he's twenty-four. <laughs> um, or no, he just turned he turned twenty-five. Uh, but that was his age twenty-four season. So like. Again, like we've said, your prime usually starts at like 27. Bron didn't win his since 27. Jordan didn't win a ring till like 27. Like, right. I think like, that's, the fact that that's when so we talk about early. peak of their powers players, like, we're right. talking like 2012 LeBron. It's like, oh, and defensively, a, too, Tatum is, uh, is way better. I'd say that too. As of yeah. right now, too. And again, better. a lot of that is just like, age like bro yeah LeBron's about to be 39 he cannot give you all that on both sides of the ball if we were playing to 21 it's a different story <laughs> it's like 82 game season like that's very hard for him to do at that age so like just the output that he's giving you now and even what he did in that elimination game against the Nuggets like what more can you ask for from this man and for the longest time like again to me LeBron is the greatest player ever like there was a long period of time, even in the last couple of seasons, where it was hard for me to be like, there's not a better player in the league than LeBron. Like it's really been hard for me to get off of that and really be like, okay, it just it has to happen at some point. Like it just feels weird though. It always is gonna feel weird. Like yeah. Um, but like you said with Tatum, the defense is is definitely better. The shot creation is crazy. Like his ability to score at all three levels, um, the rebounding, the playmaking, like there's very few holes in his game. Um, 
And on top of all of that, he has those intangibles, those crazy moments. Put up, was it 51, 50, anything in it with 53 in mm-hmm. the game seven on Mother's Day with his mom court size. Like he's got the those clutch moments that you want. All those little things that you feel like when you got to start splitting hairs, like that's what kind of comes into, into conversation. Like with like the – season on the line really against Philadelphia there in game six where he had a horrible first three quarters comes down the stretch and puts the game away to set up the game seven like if he doesn't roll his ankle like they probably were in the finals like that momentum was crazy um going into that game the fact they were even able to get to game seven down oh three um so Look, I am never going to bicker back and forth about somebody that had it in a different order and had LeBron at one or Tatum at two. Like, they are both well-deserving of that spot. But, you know, projecting a little bit, again, with how Tatum played last year with the addition of of Chris Stapps and, like, where that team is going, I think it's fair to put him out at one. Nice. Yeah. Well said. I I want to ask you this question real quick. And, obviously, this is just a hypothetical. I'm generally just curious. If, if you could have, <clears throat> excuse me, if you could have Kawhi Leonard fully healthy, like you guarantee you he'll be fully healthy the season and the whole playoff run, mm-hmm. would you rather have him or Tatum? Right now? Right. Like this is an upcoming season. Like you're guaranteed he's not going to, I mean, obviously he'll miss like 10 games in a regular season, but he'll play fully in the playoffs. Which one, do you, which one would you rather have? Kawhi. Okay. I was thinking the same thing. Because I was like, honestly, I was just looking at peaks and I was like, bro, like, I, Kawhi was healthy, man. Like, this could be a whole different list. Bro, what he did on that Raptors run is crazy. Like, the way that he really would control the game on both sides of the floor. Like, if we're talking fully healthy Kawhi, the defense is even like, even if it's just 85% of what it was when it was like peak powers Kawhi. Mm-hmm. Bro would literally go on one side of the floor, lock up your best player, rip him up, go give him a bucket and do it again. Mm-hmm. Both like controlling the game on both sides of the floor. As good as Tatum's defense is, like Kawhi is one of the best defenders that we have ever seen. For like, sure. Genetically alone, like bro's got the big hands for a reason. Uh pause. But like <laughs> that, like that alone, I think, is why I would take Kawhi. Like, I don't – there's been very few players ever in the history of basketball, I feel like, that dominate the game on both sides of the ball. Like, over that kind of stretch of time. Like, it's not like a night here and there. It's like, no, the entire playoff run, he is clamping up your best player and can give you 40. Yeah. I'd, I'd probably agree. I think I'd take Kawhi as well. Fully healthy. He was different, man. If he was fully healthy, like if he didn't have all these injury problems, who knows where he'd be as far as Clippers might potentially have a ring by now. Like so many what ifs in the NBA. That's kind of what makes it interesting, too. It's so many what ifs. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I would probably have to take Kawhi. Um, before we get into the NFL stuff, the FIBA basketball uh, friendlies have been going on. Luca has been going crazy. Apparently, Rudy Gobert is a stretch big now. <laughs> Said oh hitting his first three felt like losing his virginity. That was crazy. A hey, yo. <laughs> That's a wild uh, statement. <laughs> <laughs> um, I saw Santi Aldama highlights with Spain. So it's definitely international basketball season because we got <laughs> role players going crazy overseas. Um, but USA Basketball had their first um those scrimmage against the the Puerto Rican team um, and really balanced scoring output from everybody. Uh, I think the leading scorer was, I think it was Ty. Cam Johnson had 15. Um, Anthony Edwards also had 15. Mikel with 14. B.I. with 11. Triple J with 12. Brunson had 11. A.R. came off the bench with nine. Yeah. Um, They had him a couple of highlights. That little post shimmy kind of, I was like, okay. Listen, we redoing the shooting guard list, bro. AR's up there. I knew it, bro. I was like, bro, I should just be mad biased and just put him up there just because. Over players, I know he not better than. Now I'm mad. Now I should have did it. <laughs> no, he was – He looked, honestly, everybody on this team looked good. 
Tyrese Halliburton in 21 minutes put up seven points, four rebounds, and 12 assists. Um, he is going to be serving them bro. up. Oh my! I God. cannot wait to watch this Pacers team. And he just the way that he plays, he plays so fast and like free. Mm-hmm. It's like yeah, bro. Um, I'm excited for this new era of USA basketball. Like even when when Paolo came in and was getting some run, it's like, bro, this team is young, athletic. They can push the pace. Um, Jaron looked really good on the offensive side of the ball. He had two blocks as well. B.I. had a couple of blocks. Uh, Mikel, he looked good, but he also did get shifted by Tremont. So shout out Tremont. Tremont was hooping. Tremont was hooping on them. Um, so, um, yeah, shout out to, to Team USA. Uh, I'm very excited to watch the whole FIBA World Cup because we know international Luka is a different monster. I'm waiting for the time that he for real, like, it's either going to be in like a World Cup or an Olympics. Like, he plays like the U.S. in like the semifinal. He gives them like 60. (laughs) (laughs) It's going to be like an iconic moment. Beats the U.S. team, comes back to the NBA season, MVP, finals MVP. Like, takes over the basketball world. Yeah, he's be the go. (laughs) Be the go instantly. Um. You got anything else? Any, any, any uh, anything else about the the FIBA friendly before we get into this AFC North prediction? You get to get your hot takes off about them bum Steelers. But hey, don't disrespect, bro. <laughs> Do not disrespect. We, I've been dealing with enough of that this offseason. But now nah, I'm, uh, I'm I'm excited. Let's get into this football stuff, man. Okay. Well, since the preseason is going, if you're going to preseason games. You're going to get some tickets. Use SeatGeek. And if you're on SeatGeek, be sure to use code off the glass, all one word, for $20 off your first SeatGeek order. Like I said, the preseason is now in full swing, and we're only a few weeks away from Sunday football, week in, week out. College Ooh. football is coming. It's that time of the year. NBA is going to kick off shortly after that, so it's going to be a lot of sporting events to go to. So SeatGeek has got you covered for all of that. Like I said, code off the glass will get you $20 off your first SeatGeek order. Without further ado, here we are at 1 minute and 6. Put it down for the timestamps if people want to fast forward. So if you, if you just came here from the beginning of the episode and you're just here for the NFL – We still appreciate you because now it's time to dive into the AFC North predictions. Ravens, Bengals, Steelers, Browns. Which team do you want to start with? I want to just like talk through all the teams and then at the end we can give our final regular season standing predictions. So what team do you want to start with? All right. Um, So I'm a Steelers fan, but I don't. I got something saved for that, so I don't. I don't want to start with them. Yet. Okay, let's just let's start with the Bengals, just okay. because the Bengals obviously are, are seen as the best team in this division. Obviously, have the best quarterback in this division, so we we could talk. We can start with the Bengals. We can definitely okay. start with the Bengals. Um, so going through their off season, some of the bigger signings they got: Orlando Brown, Earl Smith, um, Terrell Basham, Jermaine Pratt. Um, they did lose Samaj Piran to the Broncos, Hayden Hurst, Eli Apple, Trey Flowers, Von Bell, and Jesse Bates. So some big, big hits to their secondary. Um, but look, with Joe Burrow, <laughs> Joey Cool, with all the different <laughs> nicknames you want to give him, anything is possible there in Cincinnati. Um, but, you know, with – the injury that he suffered earlier in training camp, I think um, they gave an update recently and they said that he's still multiple weeks away. They kind of have been speculating, like we might be looking at like a week five or six, like return. Mm -hmm. Um, And so like, when I look at their schedule, let me pull this up. So like that, that would mean that they would probably play at Cleveland at home against Baltimore the Rams, oh my gosh, Titans, Cardinals, they kind of have a cakewalk schedule to start. Um, they, they're going to they're gonna lose to Cleveland and Baltimore, though. I, I think, think so. they might beat Cleveland without – I don't know. We'll, we'll get, I'm just not high on the Browns. Um, but like, they got the Rams, they got the Titans, they got the Cardinals. Uh, so maybe able to at least get out of there decent before they get into a tough stretch in their schedule. Because, again, if we're looking at him coming back around week six – 
You got Seattle. They may may wait until week eight because they do have a bye week seven, but then he would come back against San Francisco, yeah. Buffalo. Then you got at Baltimore, the Steelers, Jacksonville. Um, that's a little bit of a, a tough stretch for him to, to walk into. But what do you what do you think about the Bengals this upcoming season? Um, and like how they, they project coming off of their tough AFC championship loss um, <clears throat> to the uh, the Chiefs last year. So um, I was high on the Bengals coming in. Um, The only thing that kind of worries me, obviously, is just the Joe Burrow cap injury because the way they've been moving as far as their offseason, their offseason moves and just how they're going to how they look like they're moving, moving forward. It looks like they're just like, all right, this is Joe Burrow's team. We're just going to give you the keys and we're going to let you essentially carry us, basically, like letting go all those people in your secondary. Um, It's going to help pay him and keep his weapons on this roster. So I just feel like they're trying to do the most to like, you know, solidify him with a good offense and a good offensive piece around him, signing Orlando Brown, give him some more protection. So it's like the way they're moving is like, we know this is Joe Burrow's team. This is his, he is our future. So we're going to do the best to build a, a solid enough offense around him and have him win games basically on his back a little bit. So mm-hmm. now th- what worries me is the fact that, like you said, if we're looking at a week five return, or just like if he's gonna miss the first couple of games, I think they'll lose to Cleveland. Cause honestly, I think Joe Burrow's only beat Cleveland one time. Like really? He, yeah, Joe Burrow is not good against Cleveland. Like against the Browns, I think he's one and four against the Browns in his whole career. Like he just recently got his first win last year, and I don't think he's ever beat Cleveland in Cleveland. So it's like is even if like I'm not that high on the Browns either. But even then, I just feel like the fact that I don't know, like you know, certain players and certain teams just. Other teams just have their number for some reason. It's like, I don't mm-hmm. know what it is with Joe Burrow and, and the Cleveland Browns, but even with Jacoby Brissett or whoever, like, they just always seem to win. So I could definitely see them losing that first game. I think Baltimore, it, without Joe Burrow, I also think that one's a loss. I think Baltimore's defense is really, really good, and I think mm-hmm. their offense is going gonna, is gonna to be a lot more fast-paced, a lot more high-octane. So I like Baltimore in that game as well. I think the, the Rams are going to suck. Sorry, right, let's just say <laughs> let's just yeah. say we're looking at a week five return. I think they can be 0 2. I think they'll beat the Rams. This is all without Joe Burrow. Tennessee is a sneaky one. Like Tennessee is one of those teams that is always good. The defense is always gonna be there. The defense is always gonna be there. They can lean on the running game. And now you have DeAndre Hopkins when you go into that play action, open that between him and Traylon Burks on the outside. Like that opened mm. things up. It's like I without Joe Burrow, I can honestly see in Tennessee. I can I can honestly see that being a loss too. Yeah. So it's like the real thing is, can they come out of being in an, a one three start with Joe Burrow? Does he rush back? Maybe if they're like, maybe if they go o two, maybe if they go one and three, do they? Does he rush back and come back a little bit earlier than he's supposed to? So like those are things I'm kind of concerned about moving forward. But I mean, just hopefully, I feel like if you're the Bengals fans, you're hoping to at least split one of those first two games. Because going 0-2 in general, even with Joe Burrow, is tough. Because I think the numbers on like making the playoffs when going 0-2 is like something crazy. But yeah, I think you're hoping to split those first two games. I think you'll beat the Rams even without him. Tennessee is going to be a tough one without him. I can honestly see them losing that. And then Arizona sucks. They want to lose all their games anyway. They stink. So mm-hmm. yeah, best case scenario if you're a Bengals fan, you probably want to go. Was that split and two one? You want to be like. Two and two, you can handle two and three. Best case, maybe three and two. Like you want to be somewhere in that range. You definitely want to don't want to start like one and four or something like that. And then, and then now, like you said, that's supposed to be their easy part of the schedule. Now you're looking at after the bye week, San Fran, Buffalo, Houston's going to be kind of a cakewalk. But then Baltimore, the Steelers, Jacksonville's going to be solid. So you definitely want to at least start out somewhere around five hundred, so you're not like digging out of a hole. Yeah. I, to me, when I look at this like this defensive depth chart, it is a downgrade from last year. Like they're definitely, like you said, they're getting off of some of these veteran guys and trying to go young, which in an effort to like you keep your core guys, you can pay Joe, you can pay Jamar, pay um, uh, T Higgins as well. And it's like mm-hmm. you keep those guys. Um, and you like you can just find young guys to like play. You keep that championship window open a little bit longer before somebody's gonna walk for more money. Um, 
But like, I mean, like Chidobi Awuzie being the starting corner here is like, I don't know. Like, I like Mike Hilton a lot in this, like the slot. I think he's one of the better nickelbacks in the league, um, especially from like a like a pursue and tackling perspective. Like, he come up and, mm-hmm. and hit. Uh, I like him a lot. It's just it feels a little thin. Safety's like losing um, to some of the veterans Jesse that Bates. they did there. Yeah, like Jesse Bates and Von Bell. That's tough. Interiors and like their pass for us, like obviously still having Trey Hendrickson and Sam Hubbard. Um, Sam Hubbard was the one that had the like the crazy fumble recovery touchdown, right? Um, against the the Ravens. I think I think, uh, I think so. I can't fully remember honestly. Um, either way, like both of them, very good off the edge. You still have you know Logan Wilson and Jermaine Pratt in the interior. You still have DJ Reader, so. It's a little bit better in the front seven. My concerns come more so in the secondary. Um, they did bolster down the offensive line, which has been a problem for the Bengals since Joe Burrow got there. Yeah. Um, which is like going back to those like memes <clears throat> people would make of like Joe Burrow trying to throw Jamar Chase, but he doesn't have time ever. Right. <laughs> um, but so like they bring in Orlando Brown, one of the better uh, left tackles in the league. Still have Ted Karras at center, Alex Kappa, one of the better guards in the league. Jonah Williams at right tackle. And still have Leo Collins, who I mean, this site is projecting is not going to start. But, like, from a talent perspective, like, when I used to watch Leo Collins, uh, it was LSU. Yeah, LSU. Um, and then when his time with the Cowboys, like, he's got all of the physical talent to be, like, a very good lineman. Um, so hopefully they can figure out a way to make him fit somewhere in the starting five. Just I, I think he's a very good um, both pass and uh, run blocker. Um so yeah, I, I really think so much of their season really hinges on what does what record can Trevor Simeon get them to until right. Joe Burrow gets back? Like that's going to be the story for this Bengal season. Because um, if he can keep them in a decent spot, like you're definitely in contention to win the division. Like you said, but if you're looking at one and three or one and four, then it's like Joe Burrow comes back and y'all have to get red hot quick to try to make a wild card spot mm-hmm. possibly. Yeah. Um, so I think it's going to be the biggest, biggest storyline for this Bengals team. And I, like I said, I'm very interested to see what the heck this defense looks like, specifically the secondary, because there's no shade to Wuzie, like somebody that's also a former Cowboy. Like, but it's just, I don't know, bro. I don't know. That is mm. thin in the in the secondary. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's move on to the Ravens. That's how I kind of have these tabs listed out here. Mm-hmm. Um, so let me pull this up. So when we look at their biggest signings, three big ones, big Nelson Aguilar is not super big, but like they needed receivers. Nonetheless, they bring in Nelson, they bring in OBJ, who I'm very excited to see with Lamar and just excited to see what he looks like healthy again. Um, just even if he's 75% of what he used to be, that's going to be a very, very big pickup for them. They also mm-hmm. signed Rocky Sin as well, um, former corner. I think he played with the Raiders for a long time. Um, but they also draft Zay Flowers, who I am high on as well. They, I am as well. This this receiver room now with Odell, Zay Flowers, you have Bateman. Um, and so you also have Nelson Aguilar there. And then also, obviously, Mark Andrews and Isaiah Likely. Finally, Lamar, I think, has some competent receivers to throw to. Mm-hmm. And teams will not just sit there and bracket coverage Mark Andrews. And then just <laughs> like, like, I don't know who you're going to throw to. So, like, Devin oh, Duvernay on the outside. It's like, come on, bro. What can this uh, guy do? Yeah. So, I, I think the Ravens made very good additions there in terms of, of like, I think it was their biggest need. It's just adding more receiving weapons on offenses. So you unlock Mark Andrews more back to what he used to be. Um, opens up the run game more. It just, everything is better if you are a threat to throw to more than just your tight end. 100%. Uh, and then we, we kind of touched on their defense earlier, but uh, this defense is very, very good. Um, obviously bringing in Roquan Smith last year, you still have Patrick, Patrick Queen. Um Front seven is is good. You got Michael Pierce and Travis Jones um, up the middle. So Travis Jones has had a very good camp from what I've seen and heard. 
Um, and people have been kind of diving into some of his like all 22 film from last year. He's only going to get better. He's only going to get stronger. So, um, you know, he'll be big at solidifying up front for them. Linebacker room is very good. Like I said, Patrick Green, Wolcon Smith, and Tyus Bowser. Um, they've got good corners. They still got Miles uh, or Marlon Humphrey, Kyle Hamilton, Marcus Williams. Like you've got, they're very, very good defense. I think the Ravens are in for a big year. I think Lamar is in for a big year. I think people have started to get a little bit disrespectful uh, with Lamar. And again, I think a lot of that just has to do with, like I said, teams were coming out and just all you got to do is take away Mark Andrews and that shuts down 70% of the, the Ravens offense. It's just what can Lamar do with his legs? Um, so with more options there, like I said, with Lamar, J.K. Dobbins hopefully back healthy. Um, and then this O-line still is, is set up together well. I've also been seeing reports from camp that they've been trying to figure out how to get Patrick Ricard reps on the O-line. I've seen that, He's yeah. like This is like one of the most crazy Swiss Army Knife players, like full back. Then they try to put for him real. at – they had him at D-tackle for a bit. Now he's about to play <laughs> Like, they just want him on the field. That's what it is. They just yeah. need bro he'll on the play, field. He'll playmaker. Make plays. Yeah. I respect <laughs> um, So, yeah, I'm I'm really high on the Ravens' upcoming season. I'm really high on Lamar because I think the disrespect has gotten a little bit too far. Like, bro won MVP a couple years ago. Like, come Unanimous. on. It's not – right. He's not – y'all are gassing it. It's not his fault. I'm not putting the blame on him. If he don't perform with this core, right, we, can start right. to, we can start to talk. But it's very different, like you said, when you have Odell and Rashad Bateman and Nelson Aguilar and likely and Mark Andrews as opposed to you know Devin Duvernay. I think they have like a super old Sammy Watkins for a little bit. Yeah, it's like, like and those these guys are your number one receivers. It's like what can you expect this guy to do in already a run first offense with a very who was like one of the worst in the league as far as like pace of play. Like there was a slow pace offense. There was a run first offense. And then, a lo- like, along with the fact that you lose your number one receiver in Rashad Bateman, like, I think week two or three in the season. Yep. Mark Andrews again double teamed. It's like, bro, you're throwing to a return specialist, Devin Duvernay, who I actually think is a good playmaker, but he's not a number one receiver. Yeah. The nasty like, kick returner. Yeah, I'm about to say, he's a good kick returner. Like, he's a good special teams guy. He's a good playmaker. But if he's your best receiver on the field, that is a problem, no matter who the yeah. quarterback is. So it's like, you switch, you switch out all these receivers with Odell Beckham Jr., whether you think he has anything left in the tank, he's still 10 times better than whatever they had last year. Then you have Zay Flowers, who, like you said, you are high on. I'm very high on Zay Flowers. Like, I think he's going to do wonders in this slot for them. I think he's going mm-hmm. to be big, and I think he's going to be big right away. Um, Rashad Bateman's health has always kind of been a problem, so I don't really know what his injury status is. I think last I seen he was – doing drills on the sideline like he was just getting back from his injury whatever injury he had so if they can get all three of those guys together healthy even if one of those guys aren't like top of the league like one of the best receivers in the league the fact that you have all of them together along with your number one your real number one option in mark andrews mm-hmm. that is a very 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 good receiving core and, and the new oc no more greg roman who i know a lot of ravens fans were not happy with no um, felt like the offense got I think two stale and one dimensional at times, mm-hmm. um, especially from a play calling perspective. So no more Greg Roman. Um, was it Todd Monken is his Todd name? Yep. Yeah. Um, there now is the OC. So, um, yeah, I, I'm expecting a lot f- from Lamar and the Ravens because I think it was Ryan Clark was on first take and they were talking about Lamar and it was like, Stephen A said something crazy about him. He was like, bro, you're acting like, Lamar didn't turn the NFL into like playground recess football for a full season was literally out here making the best defenders on the planet look like children. Yeah. Spin spin move, breaking off two people at the same time. Like if you can get enough weapons around him to where it just gets hard to key in very hard on one thing, his offense is going to be wide. Like he's, it's going to open that, up so much. He's the most, again, being very specific with my wording, the most dynamic player, quarterback, like in terms of his ability to pass and run. He's the best, I think, the best running quarterback 
still is, a, I think, a very good passer. He just needed the weapons. Um, and so now those are there. So I, I think he's going to perform well. Like I said, if he doesn't, we can start to talk. Everything that we've seen last season, like, I'm not – worried that much about it i'm interested with the new oc and with this new um you know kind of revamped receiver room what lamar is able to do and what this ravens team is able to do yeah i listen we i don't want to get too deep in it now once we start making our uh our predictions for where people are gonna where the teams are gonna be at in this division but i i am very high on the ravens as well like just i'm just leaving it at that i hopefully they can actually get jk dobbins back i don't know what's been going on with him like yeah, I think it said injury, and I, last time I heard he was asking for a contract or something. I don't know what's going on, but if they can get him back as well, it's like then you have this great passing attack, or potentially great passing attack, and then you have J.K. Dobbins, who I think is a very good running back in the league. So it, yeah, it, it it can get really really scary for the Ravens or, or for other teams in this division, basically. Yeah, um, let's go to the Ravens' biggest rival. We'll talk about your Pittsburgh Steelers. Oh yeah, um, biggest biggest off season signings. A long list. Um, <coughs> some of the big names here: you got Isaac Sumalu, uh, Braden Fajoko, um, Patrick Peterson, and Demonte Casey as well. So bolstering up the offensive line, bolstering up the secondary. You got Cole Holcomb as well. Uh, they really got a lot of needs addressed here. Um, not just in free agency, but when you look at players drafted as well, Roderick Jones, Joey Porter, big boy Darnell Washington, who yeah. uh, I've, seen, I've seen some of them training camp clips. I don't know, man. Baby and people, man. He's out here baby and people, bro. I'm, listen, I'm excited for my Steelers, man. I'm excited. Look, and you got the you got the Georgia shirt on, bro. When the fact that he wasn't the number one tight end at Georgia is still like, what is? I, I, That's oh, how I good keep, Brock Bowers is. Yeah, I was about to say. Yeah, I couldn't remember his name for a second. Brock Bowers, like, he's gonna be nice. Bro. What? <laughs> you had a you had a genetic freak backing you up. Yeah, bro, he is going to be gross when he gets to the league, bro. I'm excited to see that. Yeah. I definitely but am. The clips I've seen of Darnell has been scary. Scary. Yeah. Um, and then they, obviously they get Allen Robinson in the trade. Um, not a ton of big losses in free agency. Um, Devin Bush, Miles Jack, um, Terrell Edmonds as well. Um, also lose Mason Rudolph. So whatever. <laughs> 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 I just the name is always funny because of the, the helmet got thing. smoked yeah. by the helmet. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, look, tell, talk to the people about how you feel about your Steelers coming into next year. Cause I'm not going to lie. I've seen a lot of other people who have been surprisingly high on not even just the Steelers, but your boy, Kenny Pickett coming Bro. into next season. Listen, I understand we're in a very, very tough division, but I think people are generally underrating what the Steelers could potentially be this upcoming season. Now, look, yeah, a lot of y'all may not know I'm a diehard Steelers fan. Diehard Steelers fan. But I'm very I feel like I'm very unbiased when it comes to my Steelers. I'm more unbiased with the Steelers than I am with the Lakers. I'm gonna be completely honest. So, but I, I do think that this Steelers, I'm gonna just talk about the defense at first. I think that the defense is gonna be well improved. I think that people forget that we lost TJ Watt for majority of the season last year. Mm -hmm. And our defense is a completely different defense with TJ Watt in there. Like he is one of the best edges in the entire league. And I feel like people are also disrespecting him too. Like I've seen a lot of top players lists. I've seen a lot of people, like a lot of TV shows do segments of like, oh, who the best players in the league are. And people are so quick to put guys like Nick Bosa, Miles Garrett, way ahead of TJ Watt, which I understand if you rather those guys, cool. But it's like TJ Watt is also in that conversation. TJ Watt almost TJ Watt would have broke the sack record if he didn't miss games. It's like, yeah, this guy is one of the best edges in the league and one of the best defensive players in the league. So with him back fully healthy, like you said, we address we had addressed some of the needs that we had as far as our secondary because our pass game, our pass defense was absolutely atrocious. Like it was horrible. I remember watching AJ Brown was on my fantasy team. It was super bittersweet when he torched us for three touchdowns, <laughs> <laughs> catching. Catching nine balls over both of our, our corner and our safety. But 
Mika Fitzpatrick is still the best safety in the league, in my opinion. We drafted Ooh. Joey Porter Jr. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> like that. Yeah, it's like that. He's the best safety in the league. Now, he's up there. He's one of the best safeties. He's definitely up there. He's one of the best safeties in the league. Um, Like you said, Patrick Peterson is a little bit older, but he is a veteran. He can help out Joey Porter Jr., who he drafted, who can develop. I'm not saying he's going to be a world beater off the rip, but I just feel like he's going to be an improvement for us. So I think that along with T.J. Watt being back, his pass rush helps our pass defense, obviously. So I just think that the defense should be improved. I think we were like the 29th ranked defense last year, passing and rushing. So, yeah, it wasn't good last year. It really wasn't. As far as the offense, man, I, bro, I'm excited, bro. You just talked about Darnell Washington. They call him the 6 0 lineman for a reason. He is going to be out there. He is mm-hmm. going to help Najee Harris a lot because them yeah. holes are going to be open. And people forget Najee Harris had a bad start to the season, but people forget he had like a metal plate in his right. foot. Right injury yeah like he had a metal plate in his foot he was not 100 percent, and it was obvious as soon as he, literally as the game after he took the metal plate out every game since then he was playing way better he just looked way better he looked more fresh he looked like he had a little bit better of a burst so i think that along with the fact that we got darna watching out there we drafted another old lineman i forget his name another georgia guy but drafted another old lineman listen we got our weapons have always been good, but adding Allen Robinson, I think I like him as a wide receiver three. Mm-hmm. I didn't like him as a wide receiver two, obviously, um, with the Rams. It just it just didn't work out, really. But yeah. as a wide receiver three, I, I I like him there. George Pickens, second year leap. You know how those receivers get in that second year. And NFL the way young talks, boy. Man, the way he talks, the way – listen, I'm high on George Pickens. The way man. he blocks, like <laughs> he's a menace. Bro, he is – there's a case to be made that he – he's one of the best jump ball receivers in the league already. You right? saw the clip of uh, him on Joey Porter in that one, one-on-one? Insane. In That's good defense. That's, that's disgusting. good defense. That he's disgusting. just that good. He's just that good. He just makes circus catches. And 50-50 balls, those are 80-20 balls with, with George Pickens. So you still have him, Deontay Johnson. He's going to be – I think he's going to lead the team in receptions because he's going to be that more like – possession receiver every yeah. down but as far as red zone and big plays george pickens is going to be that guy for us and yeah and then my boy kenny pickett man listen people you forget big, you big on kenny pickett listen i wasn't high on him when we drafted him I'm not, I'm not a huge college guy in general so i didn't know much about him but the fact that it was a weak quarterback draft um i don't know like and in, in, in the beginning i wasn't too high on kenny pickett but the fact that we were winning games later down the stretch i think we mm-hmm. ended the season i think he ended seven and one or six and one it was something like that seven and, and two sh- after the bye okay seven and two and he showed flashes like i seen a lot of good things especially when the pocket broke down i see him create for i see him create outside of the pocket make some throws on the run like i've seen a lot of good things that i like for kenny pickett so i believe that that along with the fact that i'm hearing a lot of good things out of training camp i heard that he got stronger i heard that his arms gotten stronger and just in general another Full, another offseason, more time to just develop and get better as a quarterback, along with having a better online, line having a better running game, and having good weapons around him. I think that Kenny Pickett is prime for – not. I'm not going to say a huge breakout year, but he's definitely going to be a very, very solid quarterback in this league. So all that with the defense improvement, offense improvement, and Mike Tomlin always having a history of overachieving, having winning records when we probably shouldn't. I think people are, are underrating what the Steelers could be this year. Yeah, I, look, I I think that the Steelers are going to be much improved from last year. They were like they needed a little bit of help, but they could have made the playoffs. Like, yeah, even so they started like two and six, right? Two and yeah. six at, at the bye, finished seven and two, and only needed I think like the Patriots and one other team to lose because um, they won in Week 18. They just needed a little bit of help getting in, weren't mm-hmm. able to fall their way. So it's like. This could be a playoff team. Like, I don't think they're going to win the division. I know we'll get to that in a little bit. But, like, they're good enough to sneak in as a wild card team. Um, Like I said, a lot of that, I think, falls on to Kenny Pickett's development um, going into this year. Um, I hope Najee Harris kind of returns to form a little bit. Like you said, obviously, with the foot injury. He was on one of my fantasy teams for a little bit. Um, So, I I have faith in him um, because you just don't fall off like that. That's not how that works. So hopeful that having, you know, some good health this offseason and going into the season will will get him back on track. 
NFL young boy is different. George Pickens is crazy. He's a nice uh, bro. I'm so you. I like him and Deontay Johnson together with uh, Pat Fryermuth. I think those are all like reliable weapons for Kenny Pickett. He's got versatile weapons. Like you've got possession receiver in Dejounte. You've got the big tight end. You've also got a big super athletic tight end. Um, you've got George Pickens as the jump ball guy. Like you said, Allen Robinson. I think will slot in really nicely as like a complimentary third receiver there. And then look secondary the joy porter is young we'll see how quickly he can really get up to speed uh but you have good veterans there for him in minka and patrick peterson still have keanu neal I mentioned monte <laughs> casey as well like secondary is good i'm not concerned about the front seven at all you've got cam hayward and tj watt like that alone is you're straight got cole holcomb as well to help bolster the linebacker room a little bit like Steelers defense is nice. Like I said, I think a lot is going to rest on, on Kenny Pickett. Um, last team here in the AFC North, the Cleveland Browns might be the most, I would say, interesting in terms of their season can go a couple of – really one or two ways. Like, yeah. A lot of it depends on what the heck Deshaun Watson looks like. Because if he looks like we look like last year – that might be the worst contract in the NFL. <laughs> mm -hmm. Him and Russell Wilson. <laughs> oh my gosh, he's got to. Russell Wilson's got to be. He's got to be back, right? He got to be back. Uh, somewhat. Did you watch the preseason game? I heard it didn't look good. Really. Uh, it really, his old line is just horrible. Oh, but no. man, yeah, he, he, it might be another year of. Uh, I don't know. I don't know, Russ. I'm gonna be honest, but we'll get to that. That's in a future crazy. episode. <laughs> Uh, okay, so biggest um, inquires for the Browns. Um, they did get Elijah Moore. They got Marquise Goodwin, Juan Thornhill. Um, and then in terms of biggest losses, they lose Jacoby Brissett. Obviously not a big need now that Deshaun doesn't have to come back from a 12-game suspension because the boy is a freak and needs help. Mm -hmm. um, lost Kareem Hunt. You lose Davion Clowney. You lose Deion Jones, Rodney Harrison, Greed Williams. Um, so some, some solid losses there. Not, I guess not really Greed Williams as much, but definitely Clowney Hunt, um, Deion Jones as well. Um, so yeah, like I said, I think a lot of this is just going to come down to what Deshaun Watson are we going to get? Are we going to get the Deshaun Watson that got, what did he need to get like a hand or a cleat in his eye and he was in Houston and then went out and had like a game winning drive. I don't even remember and, that. Or the Deshaun Watson that went up 24 nothing on the Chiefs and just he gave it Blew his it. best try. Um, like, if you can get Houston Deshaun, his team will be very, very good because they have weapons. Obviously, you have Nick Chubb, who might be one of the most consistent running backs in the NFL. Decent receiver room with Amari Cooper, Donovan Peoples-Jones, and now, like I said, Elijah Moore as well. Marquise Brown for a super speed threat. You still have David Njoku. Um Pretty good offensive line. You still have Jedrick Wills, Joel Batonio, one of the better guards um, in the league, and then Jack Conklin as well over there at right tackle. And then defensively, still have Denzel Ward, um, Greg Newsom, Martin Emerson at corner. Um, like I said, you have brought in Juan Thornhill. You still have Grant Delpit. Um, and then up front, obviously, the, the star guy being Miles Garrett. So, like, they've got playmakers at a lot, a lot of positions. All I think comes down to Deshaun Watson more than anything else because Jacoby Brissett looked better last season. Obviously, he Deshaun had been a long time off of football. So maybe, you know, getting those reps in last year, getting in a full training camp this year, just being around the team for a full offseason. Um, interested to see what he comes back and looks like. Um, not to bury the lead too much, but I am in the camp that I don't know that we'll ever see Houston Deshaun again. So I'm not super high on the Browns um, for this upcoming season, but interested to hear what your, your thoughts on the Browns are. So listen, I hate the Browns with every, <laughs> <laughs> from the deepest depths of my soul. I hate everything about the Browns and be honest with you. I hate their colors. I just hate everything about the Browns, but if I'm being fair, whether like, Whatever side you're on about the Deshaun Watson, I don't like that part really is not what I'm talking about right now. But just the fact they did have to have all that happen and then didn't have any training camp with them, couldn't practice with them, couldn't be with the team for all those weeks. It makes sense why he looks so bad. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I mean, I feel like I feel like he's gonna look better than he looked last year for sure. But it's just the the question of like you said, are you gonna get Houston to Sean? Or like how close are you gonna get to that right. old Sean? Basically, it's like what level is he gonna be at? And honestly, that part I feel like I I don't know if anyone has a clue. Like I don't I have no idea what he's gonna be at. I like I said, I just think he's gonna be better than those a couple games he had last year. And like you said, if he's first of all, if he's Houston Deshaun, this is a content like this is a Super Bowl contender. If he's yeah. Houston Deshaun, he was he, a, he was a legitimate top five quarterback, bro. When he was in Houston, bro. He has uh, an elite offensive line. He has the best running back in the league, arguably. He has a, an elite receiving core. Amari Cooper still has it. I mm-hmm. like Elijah Moore. I especially like him in this situation a little bit better. Yeah. Donovan People Jones is nice. The defense is solid. It's like. Bro, if he's the old Deshaun, he this is a contending team. I don't think he's gonna be full of the old Deshaun, but like I said, it's just a matter of what percentage are you of the old Deshaun? Are you like 70%, 80%? And then if he's that, then I think this is a playoff team, and I think that they can possibly make some noise. But if I had to lean one direction, if I had to pick one, I don't know, man. I genuinely don't know. I I go back and forth on this all the time. I think that they'll be I, – I think that they'll miss the playoffs. Like, I don't think that they'll be a top-tier team. I don't think that they'll suck, but I don't think that they'll be a team that makes the playoffs in, in the AFC. I was going to phrase it like, what would you say is more likely that the Browns win the NFC – win the AFC North or finish last in the AFC North? Finish last for sure. I think – I'm predicting them to finish behind the Steelers. I am too. Yeah. I, I just don't – I don't know. I don't have I don't have faith in Deshaun. I really don't. Not, look – for me, it's I'm not. I wasn't expecting him to come back last year and be him, how he was before. Like again, you out of the league for almost two seasons. Like it's not easy to just kind of step into that role again on a new team, like new coaching staff, new everything, and you weren't allowed to be around the team. Like I get all that. It just looked really rough. Like worse than I was expecting it to. And I, I had Amari Cooper on fantasy. He was hoping with Jacoby. Mm-hmm. Deshaun came in and done tanked his value. Like, <laughs> but I'm saying, he like fantasy aside, just like watching him, I was not expecting that big of a regression. So that's where my concern really comes from. Um, and look, I, I could be wrong. He could come out and he's comfortable again. He's whatever, like good to go and like we see something similar to what he was in Houston like you said this team will be very good if he's playing at that level because he was elevating that Houston roster a lot Mm -hmm. um so I'm just gonna go ahead and get right into my standing predictions like I have the Browns finishing last I think for what it's worth this is one of the more competitive divisions across the NFL as a whole like we both mentioned the, the Bengals and the Ravens as being legitimate contenders. We just said that the Browns, if Deshaun is playing to that level, is a legitimate contender. And then like Mike Tomlin doesn't have losing seasons. So it's like someone has to come in last. Right. Um, so I think this is going to be a very, very tough and hard fought division. Like I said, I'm a little bit out on Deshaun. So I have this Browns coming in last. Um, the Steelers in third. With the Joe Burrow injury, I do have the Bengals finishing second. I think they will still end up making the playoffs, but will be a wild card team. Um, And then I do have the Ravens with their new revamped wide receiver room coming in first in the AFC North. Uh, Like I said, I'm expecting a very, very big year out of Baltimore and out of Lamar so that we can shush all the haters up because it is getting way too crazy how people are talking about Lamar right now. Yeah. (laughs) I uh I I have the same exact order. I have the Browns coming in last, just because, like you said, I just I don't really have faith in Deshaun Watson. You don't forget how to throw the football. Like he looked like he forgot how to throw the football. It like, looked games. rough, it bro. Looked it looked horrible, bad. So I got I got them coming in last. I got the Steelers coming in third, but I think it's like one of those divisions where, you know, you got a twelve win team and a ten win team and then a nine win team. Like I don't think. Like third, I think we're fighting for a wild card spot. Like probably would need some help later in the season, but I think we're gonna have a winning record and we're gonna be fighting for a wild card spot. Um, and then, like you said, with the Bengals, if there wasn't, if the Joe Burrow injury didn't happen, I'd have them finishing first in this division, like for sure. I just think that their yeah. firepower on offense, I think 
Joe Burrow himself can is alone is going to win you a bunch of games this season. So even if you yeah. lose people on defense, that offense is going to be so high power. Joe Burrow is so good that they're gonna they're gonna be fine. But the he's, fact he's that, one of them ones. Yeah, but the fact that not only is the do you have the Joe Burrow injury? You have the Joe Burrow injury, and if he's missing a couple games, he's missing the easy part of the schedule. Right. Like he's not – like, if he was missing the hard part of the schedule, I'm like, all right, they can rattle off however many wins after. But it's like you're going to come back, like you said, face San Fran, the Buffalo, and you get a little break game in Houston, but then you play Baltimore, the Steelers who always play you tough, Jacksonville, who I think is going to be nice. It's like you got you got a tough schedule. And then you got yeah. KC, the, the Chiefs later on in the season. It's like – if you it depends on the start, but if you start like we said one and three, it could look rough because then you might rush Joe Burrow back, and then who knows? Hopefully not, but he might get re injured. You never know. So right, and calf injuries be- is like right. you went away from the Achilles. You got to play those real careful, very very careful. So like you said, it depends on which who's the backup. Trevor Simeon, that's yeah. the backup. Yeah, it depends on what they leave him at. Um, but just to be safe, I just put them second, and I have the Ravens finishing first. I like you. I'm just like you. I think the Ravens are in for a really, really big year. Like I think they're genuinely real contenders. Like they can challenge like Kansas City for well, like coming out of the AFC. I genuinely do. Just they look like they don't have many weaknesses. It sucks because it's like the the year that they had all the momentum going into the playoffs, they had that horrible wide receiver showing <laughs> it was against uh new england right the year that they had the bye week they were the one mm-hmm. seed and then literally there was like drop pass after drop pass um and they end up losing that game and since then they haven't really made any noise in the playoffs so now when they people t- people talk about afc contenders it's the same teams right you get kansas city obviously buffalo uh cincinnati the Ravens do not get put into that and conversation they're in, at they're all. They're in that class. I think I genuinely think they're they deserve to be in that conversation for yeah. sure. So. They just they have to prove it at this point. That's why I said, like, this is the year for Lamar where it's like the front office did their part, right? They also got off of Greg Roman. You got a new OC, you got revamped receivers, they got Roquan last year. The defense is still gonna play at an elite level. What can you do? Because if you can't do it with this, then it's like, that's a problem. I'm not expecting that, but it's like, you got to prove something now if you want to be regarded in that same tier of like, these are guys who are a threat to come out of the AFC year in, year out. People don't mention the Ravens because they haven't even come close to it. Right. From terms of like postseason success. Um, Yeah, I also put up Deshaun's stats from last year. He came back six games. He went three and three. 58% 58% completion percentage, 1,100 yards, seven touchdowns, five picks. Sound good. And that doesn't uh, even do it justice because, like, watching it, it looked way worse than those stats even so. Right. And then, bro, but if I go to – what was his – hold on. Let me get his QBR, too, before I get off his page. Oh, my gosh. 38 QBR. Um, <laughs> and then if I go to my guy, Jacoby Brissett – in the 11 games before Deshaun came back, they went four and seven. He had a 64% completion percentage, 12 touchdowns to only six picks. So one more pick, almost double the touchdowns. And he had almost double the QBR. He had a 60 QBR. Jacoby is never going to blow people away. But like, this is what you, I mean, I guess it's really good for what you could ask for somebody to kind of come in and fill that gap. He did what um, he was supposed to do as a backup in this right. situation. He did it. He did his job. All right. So, like I said, that coming off of, and even if you compare that to Deshaun's last season, like his last season in Houston, he completed 70% of his passes, had threw 33 touchdowns and seven picks, and then comes back last year and threw five picks and seven touchdowns. <laughs> like, yeah, man. This season is going to answer a lot of questions for a lot of people, not even just in this division in general. Season is going to answer a lot of questions. Yeah, but that uh, look, that is a big contract to not be playing. Like those are not those are like bottom of the barrel quarterback stats. That is true. It's like even if even if he's let's just say seventy percent of the old Deshaun Watson. That's not what you're paying for. 
That's oh, not no. What you, that's <laughs> not what you gave a fully guaranteed contract for. Absolutely like, not. So either way, like, they paid Deshaun Watson to be the guy that can take us to win a, a Super Bowl. If you're a wild card team, first round exit, missed the playoffs team, that is a, still a terrible contract. That is still a five-year, two hundred and thirty million dollars. Listen, him and Russ right now. This listen, we could have a year where both of these guys they're fighting for which has which one of these guys has the worst contract in NFL history. Because listen, it can get bad. It can get really, really bad if either of those guys don't bounce back. He's I, I I can't imagine Russ has another year like last year, bro. There's no way. I feel There's bad. No I genuinely way. feel bad. Like last year, I was pissed because he sold my fantasy team. But like this year, I just feel bad. If he really is, oh, that sucks. And it's like they're not doing him no favors. That offensive line is gonna suck. The offensive line is gonna be terrible. You still got Javante Williams coming off an injury. And then you lose Tim Patrick again for the oh, whole season. Bro, I, and KJ I saw Hamlet. that notification. I was like, bro, no way. Not twice. Uh, uh, ACL and then an Achilles. I mean, at least bro got paid. I just, I'm happy that he got No, paid. yeah, but like, but bro, that's damn. tough. Um, Yeah, I can't believe that. I, I, I got to believe that <laughs> Russ has got to be able to bounce back, bro. There's no way. There's no way. Um, let me pull up the stats from the preseason games going on right now. Um, let me see. Anthony Richardson went 7 for 12 with 67 yards with a pick, um, 39 QB rating, not a lot of rushing attempts. So I'm going to rewatch all these preseason yeah, games. I well, need to see it. And then with Tennessee, Malik Willis went 11 for 17 with 102 yards and a pick. Oh, my Will, God. Will Levis went 8 for 11. Oh, shoot. Let a little, find little, little QB duel, okay? Yo, I'm not going to lie. I just, like, clicked on Twitter, and I see this NC Richardson pick. It is bad. <laughs> it's bad, bad? It is bad. <laughs> oh, no. It is. Oh, no. I but mean, awesome. but so was. Uh, They're playing the Bills, damn. Um, what the heck? Uh, CJ Stroud's pick was like, it was bad too. Jeffrey Mills read that crazy. <laughs> his was worse. Like, go look at it. His is worse though. It, it's it's bad. I came in. There's no way to justify this one. Oh, I'm looking at it now. Uh oh 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 no! <laughs> you gotta throw that away. Like or don't just you, run. Don't throw it. You don't. <laughs> don't you don't even that. need to throw it. Yeah, that's crazy. What do you? Yeah. Well, first of all, what happened on the protection? How are people on his face like this? What is that tackle doing? Their O line is not that. It's not gonna be that great either. His tackle ain't blocked nobody. He has somebody inside of him. He just let him run free. Wait a minute. Didn't didn't block the guy that he was trying to block. Yo. I'm in on the Bears this season, bro. I'm sorry. I'm so in on the Bears. Well, I can't wait till we do that prediction. No, bro. Justin Fields. <laughs> he went. You want to hear his stats? He yeah. Three for three. 129 yards, two touchdowns. Huh? He, what? Threw, he threw a screen pass to DJ Moore that went 62 yards to the yeah. house. Then he just threw another screen pass. No, it wasn't even a screen. I think it was just a, a just he was just scrambling, just hit um Khalil Herbert in the flat. Took it like fifty. Took it like fifty yards to the house. Okay, I'm in on the Bears, man. They gonna listen. They gonna be nice, bro. That team, I feel like, is gonna be good, bro. At least the offense. I think the offense is gonna be solid. Yeah, I, look, I think Justin Fields. He got that that it factor. So as long yeah. as he, he got it, he don't even got to become an elite passer. You you just got to get up to a certain threshold. <clears throat> the fact that you, you he could run for like 1500 yards like he really could if they gave him the opportunity yeah um so I'm, yeah i'm i'm big on the bears oh i need football season to hurry up bro oh <laughs> my god i can't wait man i can't wait i got every sunday off too <sighs> dang okay you ready <laughs> you locked in bro oh that red god. zone is getting mm. i can't oh i'm so god. happy that they got that you could just buy a red zone now that's perfect yeah. Um, to wrap up today's episode, I went through and I am going to pull up prize picks right now. 
not a sponsor. Y'all could be a sponsor. Um, and pull up their full season projections for some of the biggest players going into next year. I just want you to tell me over or under on some of these bigger stats. I got everything, pass yards, rushing yards, touchdowns, interceptions. So we're going to go th- act- we're going to go through all of them. Actually, before I get into that, I wanted to ask you this. Have you ever seen people track training camp stats before this offseason? Not before this one. And I thought that I thought of that myself too. I'm like, bro, what who's keeping track of all this stuff? Like not even it's it's going past like, mm-hmm. oh, so and so had a good day today. I seen QBR. <laughs> bro, off of like, yeah, th- this training camp Dak Prescott has these. I'm like, who's keeping tabs on this? Like, bro, people don't realize that it is practice. These guys are supposed to make the mistakes now. Like, even seeing the Dak interceptions, yeah, I sent it in the group chat because it's funny, but it's like, seriously, I'm not like, oh my god. Some people are really taking that and running with it. Like, look at Dak, he's about to have a horrible year. Yeah, like, I don't, I'm not gonna look at it and be like, oh my god, Dak is about to go suck this year. It's like, no, he's supposed to make all of these mistakes now. Like, that, this is when you're supposed to work out all of the kinks. Like, the bad practices, that's supposed to happen. That's supposed to get you prepared for the season. So, g- keeping track of people, even the good stats, it's like, Oh, like it was. I saw a stat was like Kenny Pickett's only throwing one interception this this training camp. I'm like, okay, I guess that's good, but like, who is who, tracking these things? I, I yeah. swear. And at first, to me, it was like obviously everybody's on Dak's head because it's the Cowboys. That's what they do. Mm-hmm. But like, I feel like it even is going bigger than that. Like you said, I'm seeing it for every quarterback, and it's not like I feel like in the past I've seen like so and so had a good day, threw three three touchdowns and their reps with the ones, whatever. But it's like no, like. These are so and so stats over the last week of training camp, and like they're like 14 of 33 picks. And I'm like, who is tracking these things like that? They need to just show good clips or like really, really horrible clips and leave it at that. Yeah, I, the fact that you've seen QBRs that's out of pocket, bro. Training camp, training camp, not even a preseason game, bro. Insane, bro. They need to revoke media access. Y'all taking it too far. Um, okay, first over under I got for you here. And this is total passing yards for the whole season. Aaron Rodgers, they got him at 3,999 and a half. So basically, do you think he's going to get 4, more or less than 4,000? Oh, that is tough. That is tough. Let me, I got, let me pull up his what he's done in the past because. I've seen a stat that he hasn't thrown for 300 passing yards in, like, I think it was, like, 22 weeks or something like that. Whoa. Yeah, like, it's something, like, ridiculous. Let me just pull up his. I need to see what his baseline normally is. I'm not going to fully account for – Um, I'm not going to take this last yeah. year. It's like, okay, this up is what Up until does. last year, he had four seasons of 4,000 or more yards consecutively. I'm going to say – Last see last year he had basically thirty seven hundred with like he's struggling for weapons. Now he got his, Garrett his Wilson. Line. His own line sucks though. The Jets. Yeah, the O line isn't that great. Like it's not like I shouldn't say sucks. It's not terrible, but uh I I'd say I, I'd say over. I'd say over because if he could throw for thirty seven hundred. Last like Romeo year. Dobbs and Christian yeah. Watson. And, uh, I, I say over. Yeah. I, I, this, over. this is a bet I wouldn't put money on, but for the sake of the game, I'd say over. Okay. Um, Mahomes over under 4,800 yards. <laughs> over. <laughs> Which That's is crazy. Because over. I'm still taking over. I'm not, I'm not betting against Patrick Mahomes, bro. Patrick Mahomes is that guy. They've got even better receiving weapons. Give me the over. He, he did throw for 5,200 last year. Give that me the crazy. over, bro. Yeah. And all he got it, all he had was Travis Kelsey. Give me the over. Okay. Okay. Next one I got here. New offensive coordinator in town. They done went and got Kellen Moore, Justin Herbert. Over. Over. Under. Over. <laughs> over. 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 Whatever the stat is touchdowns, passing yards, rushing yards. <laughs> over. 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 I'm in. Okay, okay. It's 4625. Over, 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 over. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. I'm in. Justin Herbert, 
listen, I'm in. This year, All I'm right. fully in on Justin Herbert, especially with Kellen Moore. You big on Kellen Moore? I mean, he was. I, he might, had be deck. I might be biased as a Cowboys fan. I'm for the play. You don't like Kellen? You don't, don't like Kellen Moore? Dislike Kellen Moore. I just thought the play calling at times was too stale and predictable. It's like we run the ball and then we never run the ball. And it's like it's never a good balance to offense. And then we randomly have games, Dak throwing 50. Like when does – I don't – this is just like a rule of thumb. I don't think quarterbacks should ever be throwing more than like 40 times a game. Like, bro, run the ball. Y'all got to have a run game. <laughs> All right, this is this is what I say, um, because I see where you're coming from, but I do think if you're gonna throw the ball with 50 times, I think Justin Herbert is one of those guys that can that's like, no fair. disrespect to that's Dak. Fair. It's like throwing 50 throwing 50 times with Dak is completely different than throwing 50 times with Justin Herbert. That's fair. And comparing what Kellen Moore can be compared to I think well, who's the who was the OC? Something Lombardi. Lombardi, something like Joe that. Lombardi. Bro, I am sick of watching them run curl flats. Bro, a thousand times a game. I let me pull this stat up. Off. This guy has a cannon of an arm, and you're running curl flats, curl flats, slants, curls, hitches. That's it. You're throwing nothing but short, little short, quick routes. And you got a guy with a cannon. You have Mike Williams, who's one of the best contested catchers in the entire league. Like, come on, bro. I'm sorry, but now Kellen Moore, love him or hate him. I just think he will be a great upgrade compared to what they had with Joe Lombardi. Um, Let me see. There was like a stat that had, it was like 40 or something percent of uh, Herbert's passes were like at or behind the line of scrimmage. It was something crazy. Let me pull this up. That's why Eckler had like a hundred catches last year. It's like the, all right, the offense combined with, I guess the fact that, Herbert was hurt. He even said it. He couldn't really throw the ball downfield that great. But, bro, I, I'm watching. And, again, I know we bring it up fantasy a lot. I had Herbert on my fantasy team. I'm watching this guy drop back, drop back. Where's Eckler? That's all I'm seeing all game. And it pissed me off. It's just dinking and dunking down the field. Yeah. He also had the f- – I think it was his- – um, how do I word this? Like the fourth most yards via air – um, meaning like wherever the receiver is catching it, like that's where they're done. They're just done. <laughs> no yards <laughs> after the catch. Yeah, uh, you're, just throwing, you're just throwing a little flats. You're throwing curls. You're throwing hitches. Like you got Justin Herbert who has like one of the best arms in the league and you're treating him like old Ben Roethlisberger who can't throw the ball literally, 10 yards. Yeah. It's crazy, bro. Um. Okay, got another, another young up-and-coming guy, T-Law over under 41.50. On the season. Hmm. See, the only reason why, because I'm in on T Law, I think he can I think he can do that, but I'm worried because I their schedule is very easy. And I'm worried if they're gonna like not have to throw that much, if I'm being honest. Like I mm-hmm. I'm a little bit worried about that. But for the sake of like my belief in T Law, I think he'll have a breakout season. I'll just I'll go over. Okay. They got Jalen Hurts over under 3,700. What did he do last year? Let me see. Because I want to go over because I think they'll have to throw more this year. Through 3,701. Over, man. Definitely over. Because there was games, like if you're watching the Eagles last year. And where... he missed two games last year. Oh, yeah, yeah. Over for sure. Over for sure. Because then there was a game. When you watch the Eagles, it's like first half, all right, let's air it out. A.J. Brown, Smitty, Dallas Goddard. They're up 20. We're just gonna run the ball the rest of the game. So I think their schedule is a lot harder. Give me the over. Okay. Go to some of the rookies. Bryce Young over under thirty four hundred yards. I would take the. Under. I go under. Yeah, nah, and yeah. I'm going under. That's a lot. And that receiving core is not that Panthers great. Team, right? Um, CJ Stroud over under thirty one fifty. I'm going under. That O line stings. Yeah. And I don't even know if he's gonna play all seventeen games. Like I don't know if he's gonna start all of them. Okay. Um, gotta ask Dak over under 4,050. I feel like it's gotta be over because Dak is talking. Like, <laughs> I think Dak yeah. is tired of the disrespect. Dakota's yeah. coming. <laughs> it's just, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. The way they, all right, the way Mike McCarthy was talking, like, all right, we wanna be a run first team, but it's like, 
you go out and you get Brandon Cooks, and then you got Tony Pollard. He's not like a grounded pound guy. I feel like y'all have to Bro, throw the got, ball, we right? Have, we have Deuce Vaughn. We about to <laughs> my fault. <laughs> my bad. Fourth and one who's stopping 5'5", five, five, 130 pounds. My fault. They're not going to be able to see him. So, yeah, you're right. Go ahead. <laughs> no, so, somebody sent the clip. I don't even know. This is just bad personnel. It's training camp in practice. They're doing, like, good on good. And fourth and one, and they had a Deuce Vaughn up the middle, like a little ISO run. I'm like, bro, come on. Why? Why That's are so we doing funny. this? It is funny, though, because, like, they really don't have a bruiser, though. Like, y'all don't have a – like, all y'all backs are small. Somebody get Zeke on the phone, bro. Bring y'all should him sign back. him back. Y'all should sign him back for a couple mil, and that would – listen, yeah, that would be good. But, yeah, I, I'd go over because they got Brandon Cooks now. Dak is talking crazy. I'll have faith in him, and I think they'll be a good team, so I'll go over. Well, speaking of Dak, over, under interceptions on the season. Dak said he ain't going to throw double-digit interceptions. Prize picks will give you a little bit of room there. Over, under, 12 and a half interceptions. I go under. 12 is high, bro. Like I, I under, completely understand he did that last year, but... A lot of them picks... In the regular season, it was not his not fault on him. It that's very true. There was a lot of them where it just perfect pass in his hands. Drop, I can't speak. Up, pick. I can't speak to the Niners game. I'm talking about the regular season. There was mm-hmm. a lot that hit a receiver's hands first before they got intercepted. Nah, um, I'm, I'm going on. And he's never been a bro. He's only thrown over that twice since 2016, like his whole career. Like he's going on 2013. He plays for the Cowboys. All of a sudden, Dak is a bum. Bro, he, he had my fault. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you're good. That's what I'm saying. Is like he any Cowboys player is gonna get triple the scrutiny of any other quarterback. Bro, this dude threw for 40, basically 40. I will I'll say 4,400 yards, 37 touchdowns, and 10 picks two years ago. Like he had one high interception season. The last time he's thrown over 12 was in 2017. That's it. And that was his rookie year, year. He won rookie of the year and came six in MVP voting. Like I'm D- Dak is never, I don't think going to reach that top tier of quarterback, but the disrespect has got to stop and acting like this dude. Dak is a bum, bro. Like, yeah. What are we talking about? What quarterback are you going to put in an offense that's going to put up those kinds of numbers? You said almost 4,500 yards, 37 touchdowns, 10 picks on 68 completion percentage. But it was a year he threw 4,930 touchdowns, 11 interceptions. Like, he's – Dak is not terrible. Like, the jokes are funny sometimes, but he <laughs> Dak is not bad. Like, right. not a bad quarterback. He's always just gonna live in the tier outside of the elite top guys. He's Kirk and Cousins. That's okay. They're the same guy. He's literally Kirk Cousins. They're the same player. That's it. Like neither of them are bad at all. They're both right. above average. Yeah. Um, okay, let me just pull the rest of these up. Um let's go to over under on rushing yard totals. Derrick Henry over under 1200 rushing yards. And what's going to be – what is he like? He's got to be 28, 28, 29 now. This is the 28th season. Yep. A lot of tread on them tires. He ran for 1,500 last year. I'm a, I was just about to say I'm still going to trust him, bro. Until the wheels fall – I like Derrick Henry is one of those guys where he's just going to have to have a season where he just stinks before, like, we stop believing in Derrick Henry, bro. Like, he's yep. just – yeah. I, I'll go over. Even the year before that, he played eight games, almost had 1,000 yards. Yeah, he was on pace for he was on that year. I know the year you're talking about. He was on pace for something crazy that year. Yeah, he like it was like five weeks after he's been stopped playing, and he's still in like the top <laughs> five leaders of, of rushing yards. Yeah, yeah. Um, over under Nick Chubb twelve seventy five. This is tough because that determines if you believe in Deshaun though. Because even Nick Chubb when he came back was not that great. I, I, I believe in Chubb. I just believe in Chubb in general. Because if Deshaun sucks, they just gonna run the ball. I'll go over. Okay. This to the next next one to me is easy over. I'll put some bread on this one. I might actually bet on this one. Over <laughs> under Bijan 1100 rushing yards. Over. 
That man, over. Tyler Algier, had 1,100 last over. year. Over. Come on, bro. They're going to feed him like Derrick Henry, bro. Over. Okay. Now we're going to move on to receiving yards. Over, yeah. under 1,400 receiving yards for Jettas. Over. Okay. Come on, man. That's Jay Jets, baby. Over, under 1,300 for Tyreek Hill. Over. Okay. Did Tyreek say he's going for 2,000. I believe he can get somewhere close. Okay. Jamar Chase, over under 1275. Over. I'm in on Chase. Super. I think. Oh, Joe Burrow's going to be out. Mm-hmm. Nah, I still think. That one's. 75 is a lot. With T, with Tyler. But I mean, but with another, with an extra game, no 17 game season, like there's some guys who get to like 1,000 who shouldn't really be a 1,000 yard receiver now. So okay. I think 1,200, he could do that. Even if Joe Burrow missed five games, I'll still go over. Okay. Stephon Diggs, over under 1,200. I say over. I'm going over. Yeah. Okay. Tay with Jimmy G over under 1275. Hmm. <laughs> that one is tough because I don't think Jimmy G is going to throw the ball downfield or even play all 17 games, bro. He'd get hurt a lot. Um, I, last year with Derek Carr, he put up 1500. And Tay's injured now, too. He's going into the season a little banged up. I'll just say over just because – I mean under because I don't want to go over on everybody. But okay. I, I wouldn't be surprised if I'm wrong on that. Amon Ra, over under 1075. Yeah, he's a 1,000-yard receiver. Give me over. Okay. My guy's a 1,000-yard receiver, man. D-Hop, over under – this is crazy. Over under 850. I might go under, bro. I'm gonna be honest. Ooh, like he, eight, you think he can get eight fifty off of Malik or Will? I don't think he's gonna play the whole season. And I mm, even okay. if he, and like he's gonna, I think he's gonna get. I mean, I'm not predicting no injury, but he's older. Like I just think the yeah. injuries pile up. And if Malik or Will Levis take that starting spot, bro, they're not a pass first offense. Um, I don't know. I re- I just take the under just cause. Okay, over under ten twenty five for Devonte Smith. Over, I think they're gonna pass the ball a lot more this year. And he had he had a thousand last year, right? I think so. He was had close. Yeah. Um, go to his teammate over under AJ Brown eleven hundred, basically over. the same amount. He had like fourteen last year. Give me over. I think they're gonna pass the ball way more. Okay. Last receiver over under eleven fifty for Garrett Wilson. Over, I, yeah, he's in for a big one. <laughs> yeah, I, I see think- that being like 13, 14. I think he's about to spaz with Aaron Rodgers, bro. Yeah, bro. I'm in. I'm all in, bro. I think he's going 13, 14 this year. Okay. Last couple here. Got your boy, Kenny Pickett, over under 3,300 passing yards. I go. I I go under. I think he needs another. I think this year is not going to be like the breakout year. I think he needs another year of like to where he's in that 35 ish, like upwards of that. I'll go under. Okay. Desmond Ritter over under 2,500 passing yards. 25 is low. Give me yeah. over. That's, that's disrespectfully <laughs> that's low. That's bro, crazy low. Drake London and Kyle Pitts alone. We got to get to 25, bro. You just have to, bro. I'm sorry. Like, B. John's going to get a screen pass, take it 70 yards to the house. Like, right. yeah. Come on, bro. Give me over. Okay. The Aaron Rodgers replacement, Jordan Love, over under 33-25. They got his at 30. I, I was expecting you to say, like, 28 or something like that. I was about to say, oh, yeah, definitely over. We said 33? Mm-hmm. That's high. I'm in. Give me over. I'll just take it. Give me over. I, I believe it. it. I believe in, uh, in Jordan Love. I respect it. Last one I got for you here. Over, under, passing yards on the season, 2,900, Justin Fields. Over. Come on. Over. I'm in. With, with, with DJ Moore. Listen, when you put playmakers around people, bro, sometimes you don't even really got to do too much. We just The preseason game that is going on right now, DJ Moore just took a screen pass 60 yards to the house. And then Khalil Herbert took another one like 40 yards. Come on. Give me over. I mean, I can see him going for like three thousand and a thousand yards rushing. 
Last year, he put up 2,200 passing yards and then 1,100 receiving yards. Over under 4,000 yards from scrimmage for Justin or uh, yeah, Justin Fields. I say over. I could I could see him going like that's like 1k rushing, 3k passing. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I could see him doing that for sure. I could definitely see him doing that. Yeah, he's you add better what. You add better weapons, bro. It's just people elevate people elevate their games. It's real easier for people to elevate their games, bro. Hundred percent. Yeah, I might have to mess around and bet on some of these because I didn't like going through it. Some of those are low. Some of those think, are low. I think some of those are locks. I mean, besides like injuries, obviously, but right. people stay healthy, bro. I think some of those. That's are the locks. only thing I don't like about betting on like full season futures is like. If somebody just get hurt, it's like that's your whole and, and it, it, the bet will stay open the whole time <laughs> until the right. season ends. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, other than injury though, like some of those, like bro, Aaron Rodgers, four thousand yards. I feel like he got to, he has to hit that. Yeah. Um, some of these other ones are feel like locks for sure. Um, yeah, man. Look, I'm gonna do probably the rest of these episodes as we're going through the player rankings at least. We're going to keep diving into some more of the divisions as we get closer and closer to the start of the NFL season. And then we'll probably start doing one a week, mix and match, one NFL, one NBA, so y'all can get the best of both worlds. Um, and maybe sometimes we'll do some more episodes like this where we kind of mix the both of them. So we appreciate you for listening, as always, to another episode of Off the Glass. Um, again, if you listen to the, the whole way or even if you split it up, only listen to the basketball, only listen to the football, we appreciate it either way. If you're on YouTube, be sure to like, comment, subscribe to the channel. If you're on audio platforms, five-star review, leave a rating, pre-download the show. We appreciate it, as always. On the next episode, we're going to keep going with the rankings. We're going to go to the power forward uh, list and then dive into another uh, division in the NFL, which I'm going to make an executive decision right now. We're doing the NFC East so we can talk about the Cowboys. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I ain't mad at it. Um, y'all going to get my – my spicy Cowboys takes next episode from the least delusional Cowboys fan. You know, I'll promise y'all that right now. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we appreciate you for listening as always. And we out. Peace. Yes, sir.